Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to Big Friends and I, ECBRO. This show is a collection of tales by individuals who have had personal sightings, encounters, and interactions with these elusive creatures. Stories from people of many ages and from many backgrounds. The events in these stories have taken place in several states. As a listener reviews these accounts, the integrity, details, and sincerity of each story will be evident. And if you need a little encouragement in confirming what you already believe, or perhaps what you experienced personally, this podcast is for you. So ladies and gentlemen, sit back and relax, and be sure to share this around and give our YouTube channel a like. Stay tuned. Well, hello everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Bigfoot Zone. Uh, tonight we have our special guest, John Stasco. Am I pronouncing that right, John? Yes, you are. Okay, great. I always have to ask the guest because I, you know, I've been known to really butcher up some names. <laughs> so I'm glad to have you on here. Uh, for those who are just jumping on here, uh, John was our guest that was scheduled for last night. Um, however, we had some technical difficulties where we couldn't get a connection. Uh, but here we are tonight, and I'm glad we have this uh, working today. So if you are just now joining us, we encourage you to share this around. Um, uh, we got a few other things uh, we'll get into. Um, so, John, I mean, I know a little bit of information about you based off of what you've been sharing with me. Um, now, one of the last things I recall that you shared with me was the UFO encounter that you had. Um, now, but, uh, before we get into that, um, you've been involved with uh, Bigfoot research as well for how many years now? Well, all together through paranormal research, 54 years. Wow, 54 years. That's Yeah, yeah. I was doing it wasn't when it wasn't fashionable like it is today, trust me. Yeah, well, even like 13 years ago when I got involved with the Bigfoot research, uh, from that starting point up till now, I have seen a big change in just this little bit of time. Um, so, yeah, I mean, a lot of things have changed dramatically. Uh I'm sure you've seen it on social media. If you're familiar with AI images and artificial intelligence, uh, all the graphic work that people are creating just to make all these hoaxes and stuff. Uh, yeah, social media, uh, people take advantage of social media in so many different ways. But sadly, for the negative uh, side of things, where people are out there just making entertainment. And, you know, when there's people like you and me, and, and there's, of course, there's many others that take this serious, you know, um, you know, and then of course, you know, some of us have experiences and encounters along the way. Uh, we don't plan for them. They just happen. You know, uh, I know there's people out there wanting something to happen for them for the first time, but hopefully when that is, when it happens for them, hopefully it's a good experience for them. Not a bad one. <laughs> so, I'll be, I'll be honest with you. Like I said, I got into this this paranormal genre from when I was very young. I mean, I saw some things that, you, I mean, it was totally unbelievable. I mean, uh, from the time I was five years of age, in fact. But like I said, I actively pursued it when I was around. And I started around 18 years of age. I'll be 71 in, in a week. So I've been doing this for a long time. As I said, uh, nowadays, you're right. It's more fashionable nowadays. But when we first started this, not just the UFOs, but the Bigfoot and all types of cryptids, it was laughed at. Those those researchers were serious, like yourself and myself and others. We were made fun of, derided. We were called liars, hoaxers, nutcases, the works. And I worked really hard to to bring pertinent, relevant data to this field. As you know, I run other groups as well. I mean, I'm an admin in several groups, but and I try to really. I I just I don't just put stuff on here. I monitor what's on there as well. If we have a nutcase comes on here, we have somebody who's deriding it. I tell them like this. If you don't believe what this group's about, get off the group. Go find a group that you feel more comfortable with and go there and leave us in peace so we can find information out. But like I said, I've had, uh, well, I'll, I'll just tell you right off the bat. I've had three Bigfoot sightings up close and personal. 
I've seen UFOs nine times in my life. I've, I've been on a myriad of different types of cases, everything from UFOs, Bigfoot, uh, Mothman. I just, I did a Mothman investigation last summer with my wife. That's the second one I've done since uh, I, I met John Keel years ago at New York in the airport and before he passed away. And we talked about uh, his experiences down there when he wrote the Mothman prophecies. You know, I'm sure you saw the movie starring Richard Gere. But like I said, I, I've gone, I've done hauntings, um, uh, orbs, uh, even one vampire case, believe it or not, which is kind of funny. I'll tell you about that in a bit. But uh, the things that really stuck out in my mind is like, I probably debunked about 85% of cases I've been on, around 85%. Of the remaining 15%, I feel they're genuine. Now, what I'm saying is the 85%, a lot of people have a tendency to misidentify things they see. Well, one of my hobbies is astronomy. I have many hobbies, but that's one of them. So I know what I see in a night sky. And sometimes people mistake stars or planets or even uh, satellites as something that's not. But I also know when I look in the sky, what should be there and what should not be there. So these things I take in consideration. So what I do, I try to enlighten people. I've gone to schools. I've given lectures at a university. Uh, you know, a couple times and stuff on these types of things. You know, I, I belong to one of the best groups in Pennsylvania years ago. It was run by a man named Stan Gordon. And I mean, I was one of his investigators and stuff and he, so he disbanded the group. But I mean, I was, I took all the cases that no one else wanted. In fact, they used to laugh, laughingly call me the Indiana Jones of Pashu. That was the name of the group because I would take any case. That group was primarily founded because of the Kecksburg object that crashed in 65. Um, but that, it kind of diversified. We got into a lot of different things, a ghost and everything else. But like I said, I used to take all those cases. But what I, do, I try to do, Daniel, I try to take and enlighten people. I don't, I don't do this for any other reason than the love and the knowledge and you know, giving data and helping people through their experience. Because a lot of people don't want to come forward because they get ridiculed. You know, I mean, you saw the latest things on, on TV about the uh, UAP hearings and things of this nature. This is something we knew in the field for a long time was going on. But now the government's finally coming out because there's a massive, wa a massive wave of US UFO sightings around the world and UAPs. They call them UAPs. They're, they're not uh, UFOs. Now they're identified. They're, they're some type of crap up from another world. But anyhow, I digress. Uh, let me tell, tell you about the UFO on the ridge. Uh, yeah. I, ha I have pictures of this thing. I have seven good pictures of these things. And I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to submit it to your, your group. Uh, I, I, you know, but here's what happened. Uh, there's this place called California Ridge Road, not far from where I used to live. I used to live in California area, PA. Now I live in Washington, PA. Okay. I moved up there with my wife, my second wife. And I mean, I'm retired. I, I was a paralegal and before that. I ran an environmental company. So I'm pretty well versed in a lot of different things. But anyhow, so I had a Jeep CJ7 that I had built. It was jacked up. I had the top off. So my first wife was pregnant with our third child. And my other two children were sitting in the back seat with, with him. And, or with my wife. Or I'm sorry. My wife's in the front seat with the baby in, in her belly, of course, and the two in her back seat. And they had the top off. Well, it was a moonless night, May 30th, 1990, 9 p.m. So I get to the high point of this ridge and I have off road lights on my vehicle. So, you know, my wife says, John, you know what the constellations are because I'm showing my kids the constellations. But what's that behind us? Now, keep in mind, I'm on the highest point of the ridge. So I look back about 300 feet and behind some trees, I see some lights. Well, my first thought's what? Another off road vehicle like mine with their off road lights on until they started doing this about that speed. Now, they're so bright at that distance through the trees, it was blinding. Now, this is before the advent of cell phones. But I always carry a camera, always. Even today, I carry a camera on top of my cell phone. So I get out of my Jeep, and I go to the back of the Jeep, which is facing that direction. So the lights clear the trees at 300 feet. Now, that's it came from a lower direction than where I was, okay? And when it cleared those trees, the lights were so bright, I couldn't even look at it. From that distance, that, they were brighter any jet landing lights I've ever seen in my life. So it started coming toward me very slowly, probably about, oh, I'd say five miles an hour. Okay. So I start walking toward it. Now, my wife, who's pregnant, and my two children are getting really agitated and they're getting fearful. And I really apologized to them all after this because I 
I was so intent on what I was looking at, trying to find out what it was that I just kind of ignored their feelings on this. So it came toward me. And as it came toward me, it got brighter and brighter and brighter until it got about, I'd say, 35 to 40 feet away. And at this point, they were so bright, I couldn't look directly at it. So I raised my camera up like this. And as it got closer, I hit the flash. And when I did, the lights went off. And it was a fit, about a 50-foot in diameter hemispherical dish, orange in color. But it was radiating orange heat down. Now, I'm almost underneath of it. Now, I have to tell you something. I had cancer for eight and a half years. My doctor at the, the cancer center up here, himself a UFO witness, said I was exposed to some type of ionizing radiation. Now, I'll get more back to this in a, in a minute. Anyhow, so I'm standing under, almost underneath this thing. It's 15 feet or so above me. And I'm taking shots of this thing. Click, 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 click. I can see the landing gear retracting, but they didn't look like tripods. They look like sort of like your fingers going like this up into it two sets of fingers into the front and the rear. It tilted forward like this. And when it did, I saw three windows. And those three windows, one was about, well, two of them were about two feet in diameter. And the one in the middle was bigger. It was more of an oblong. And it was about four feet in diameter. In those windows, as God is my judge, I saw four beings, the grays. They, three of them were about the same height, but the fourth one was a little lighter in color and about a half a head taller. And it was in the middle window. So what do you think I did? Well, my wife will tell you, I'm not afraid of anything. I've seen it all. I've been through cancer. I've been through COVID. I've been through blood clots. Nothing like that scares me. And at my age, I could care less, okay? If I was meant to die, I'd be dead already. Anyhow, so when it tilted down, when I saw these beings, I raised my hand like this and I waved. And what they did with four long fingers, like much longer than mine, was wave back like this stunned me i got pictures of this stuff and it tilted back up and in the blink of an eye now this whole time was no noise whatsoever but i'm feeling these waves of heat my wife told me it looked like uh sort of like heat from like in the summertime from the roads but it was coming down on me orange 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 now the only thing i had on was my normal baseball cap a t-shirt and jeans you know but everywhere my i was exposed i was getting burned everywhere so this thing zipped off about 300 feet over some trees now, the ridge is real windy, so I had to go really fast to keep up with it, and it was jerking like this, you know, probably going maybe 20 miles an hour in the air. So I came around the turn, and it disappeared over a power line. So I was pretty, my wife and kids were livid at this point, so I decided to take them down to my brother. Now, my brother works for Washington County Redevelopment, and he has a, you remember the old camcorders, those great big jobbies? Well, he had oh, yeah. Not I got a little one now. It's about this big. I carry it with me too. But anyhow, so I told him what happened. So we went back up in his, he had a, a Chevy Silverado Blazer, and really nice. And uh, so we went up with three fully charged batteries. And while we're going up there and stuff, he says, John, he says, I got to get you to the hospital. Look at you. I wasn't paying attention to myself. All I know is I felt tremendous heat. So we got up to this area where it disappeared over these power lines. And we didn't see one object. We saw three in a triangular formation one at the top and one on each corner at the bottom so we start filming five seconds of the first film the, the first battery dies it's fully charged put another battery in three seconds it dies third battery goes in it's dead and the lights go off on the suv or um, his blazer at that point the one at the top went straight up and the other two went this direction so my my brother says to me john we gotta get you to the hospital now, was, there was an old hospital called the old Brownsville Hospital in Fayette County, PA. Okay. Mm -hmm. So he said, we're going to get you up there. He says, but what are you going to tell them? He, I mean, he, and now at this point, all every place that was exposed, the hair from the sides of my face, my face, my arms, and the back of my neck was all burnt. Skin was peeling off, everything else. My hair was falling out. So I said, look, I'll just, he says, you know, if you tell them you got zapped by a UFO, they're going to think you're nuts. I said, well, I'll tell him I fell asleep on an ultraviolet lamp or something. So, you know, I didn't want to create it. Like I said, back then, it was a whole nother ball game. So I go to the hospital, and they finally get me an emergency, and the doctor says, what happened? I said, well, I fell asleep on an ultraviolet lamp. He gave me this kind of look like, really, you're going to stick with that story? I said, yep. So they treated me for severe burns. Well, I developed cancer from that. I fought it for eight and a half years. I was nearly in stage four. I had to, I just, I mean, I beat it but it almost killed me in the process. 
you know, and uh, six and a half years of chemo and the rest in radiation, 56 doses of high dose radiation to kill this. Okay. And like I said, the doctor that handled this stuff, it's, it's uh, from Hillman Cancer Center here in Washington. PA. Mm -hmm. Hillman, yeah. I don't know if you, yeah, Hillman's a really good cancer center. And, mm -hmm. uh, and he, I mean, no one's ever survived 56 doses, to my knowledge, of radiation. 35 to 38 was the max. Anyhow, so uh, my, when I had a co-investigator, but not that night. Now, my co-investigator is, I'm six foot four, 230 pounds. Back then, I was six foot four, 260 pounds. So, I mean, you can't really tell from the picture. I look like an old guy. Well, I guess I am, but not. don't let that fool you. I'm still strong. I grew up, I grew up on a farm, so I was throwing bells of hay from nine, nine years of age on. Anyhow. So, yeah, real, qu real quick, I want to interrupt you real yeah. quick. Uh, one of the listeners, uh, if you want to recap on the location of where this event took uh took place because yeah it's uh, a couple people ju are just now jumping on that they, they didn't catch the very beginning when you started sharing this um but yeah before you say anything i do want to make a mention yeah fayette county uh washington area california wa uh, pennsylvania um uh, i i'm i'm getting familiar with those areas because i actually go up there uh sometimes two or three times a year uh to participate with the fayette county bigfoot research group uh speaking events so um, right. So yeah, I, I'm a little familiar with the area, so because <laughs> uh, I usually stay in yeah I stay in Uniontown when I go up there. So yeah, well, I have I have something to tell. I hope you have a lot of time tonight because I got a lot to tell you. And I'm gonna try to cram it in. But oh no problem. Thing. So but anyhow, so we go up the next day. Now my friend Devin was on co-investigator. He's six foot six and a half, six hundred sixty pounds. He's a nuclear engineer for Betis. He designs and builds reactors for our atomic subs. So he know, he's also a radiation expert. Now, as I, at that time, I was a site supervisor for an environmental company. I dealt with PCBs, polychlorinated biphenols, acids, uh, you name it. I dealt with it, petrochemicals, everything, okay? So we go up with Geiger counters. We go up with radiation badge, Tyvek suits, and protective gear. We walked into the area where that object was on the ground, and we checked the radiation. The radiation level was 150 times higher than background lethal our badges turned immediately red so but as we were monitoring it from outside that circle where it was on the ground what happened was is the radiation level started dropping down now i had something called a soil compaction device i don't know, I don't know if you're familiar with that but basically uh, not. Works, mm -hmm. well basically how it works it by the depth of imprint you can pretty good have a pretty good idea what something weighed okay mm -hmm. so i measured the depth of the imprints on the ground and it came up with a total around 30 tons so this thing weighed about 30 tons, okay? But it was on the ground. Now, when we, we, we backed out of there for a while. The next day we went up and the radiation level was normal. I took soil samples, which turned gray. The plants were not broken, they were melted, okay? So now we kept all these samples. Now, so what I did is I went back to, on our Wednesday night meeting up at Pasture up in, in Westmoreland County. I told our members and they wanted to come up with me. So we, we, work, we worked it out for a week, and we all, it was like 13 of us went back up there. In our group was everybody is in a group of professional, from police officers, scientists, you name it. Everybody in a group of professional. So one of the women uh, worked for Channel 2 News, KDK in Pittsburgh. And so I had these real powerful walkie-talkies. So the ridge is four and a half miles long. Now, so we sat up, don't laugh, at this cemetery. It's the only one I've ever seen in my life. It's called the Old West Church Cemetery. It's an outdoor church with a cemetery built around it and an outdoor bell tower. So two of us, Evelyn and I, went for a ride in my Jeep along the ridge. So we went as far down, about three miles, and we started back up, and she saw the same type of UFO hovering over a barn. So I radioed ahead, it's coming your way. So we're trying, but we couldn't get a hold of anybody. By the time we got back up there, it was gone. So the next, so anyhow, there's something more to this story I'm going to get to, but it's more of a supernatural kind of thing. But anyhow. Oh, yeah. Next, well, let me, let me tell you about that. So we're sitting in the cemetery. We have electromagnetic field detectors set up in the back of the cemetery, okay, at night. We're talking around 11 o'clock at night. Uh, it's probably not legal, but we did it, okay? Now, there was one grave in the back of the cemetery when I knew this family, this young boy, he was 16 years old of age, had hung himself in a barn. So he was buried in an unhallowed part of the ground. So one of the guys with us, he was a police officer from uh, 
uh, what the heck's the name, North for sales. He was there with his wife, who's a psych. And so he said, he should never said this. Now, the father of this little boy used to come up and visit his grave. It was in the very back of the cemetery. And he had built a uh, like a bench out of a 150-pound log sitting on two short pieces of log. So when, anyhow, so when I told the story of what happened to this, this boy, one of this guy, this police officer said, I wonder if his speech touching the ground now. Shouldn't have said that. Now we're taping this whole thing. What happened at that point was this, I'm not kidding you, we all saw it. The log lifted up, 150 pound log and directly come over and dropped at this police officer's feet. Scared the crap out of everybody, okay? Anyhow, so later that night, after everything was said and done, Evelyn, who took the tape back with her, she calls me about two o'clock in the morning, says, John, she says, there's all kinds of stuff happening in my house. I said, what are you talking about? She says, dishes are flying off the shelves and everything else. I said, did you take that tape back with you? She goes, yes. Because on that tape, we heard it say, go away. The boy, the boy's voice said, go away. So I told her how to get rid of it. I says, take it outside. I said, you have holy water in the house? She goes, yeah. Take it outside, sprinkle with holy water, burn it and bury it. And everything stopped. Well, anyhow, now that's enough for that story. But true story, it was 13 of us aside. So about, oh, about a, not even a week later, my director, Stan, calls me up and says, John, we have a possible crop circle up in Mingo Park, PA. I don't know if you know where that's at. I'm but not sure. At, it's close to Monongahela, PA, in uh, mm -hmm. New Eagle. So anyhow, I'm really familiar with that area because I'm a member of the uh, Pittsburgh Amateur Astronomers Association, and they have a uh, they have a observatory on top of the hill in the park. Anyhow, so I go down with Evelyn, broad daylight, and I have pictures of this too. Now, I want you to understand something. When I do a research, I re research everything, topographical, everything. Now, there's a set of power lines by this horse boarding stable. And if you were to follow those power lines back, it leads right back to where I saw the UFO on California Ridge Road disappear. There was a crop circle down there. It was 50 feet in diameter. Evelyn took a picture of me walking down it, and I'm wearing protective gear again. I, I'm gonna actually I'm gonna send pictures of all this stuff to you, okay? Anyhow, so the ground is gray, nothing's growing in it. They had cats there, all the cats disappeared. Horses won't even go into this area at all, but it's on the same set of power lines. So Devin and I would go up there every night, on every Saturday night, I should say, and we'd sit there and we'd watch. Now, I got to tell you something. Now, I know my your uh, listeners are want to hear more about Bigfoot and stuff, but I'm going to Oh, no. We got a lot of a mixture here. We got paranormal, UFO, aliens, everything. We're, we're, we've been getting a lot more mixture here. So. <laughs> okay. Well, do you know what a scoop mark is? Uh, honestly, no. Okay. Well, abductees get scoop marks when they're taken. Okay. When I was five years of age, I ended up with a scoop mark on my right ankle okay it's not like anything you've ever seen at 39 years of age i ended up with one on my right wrist so one night we're sitting at stan's house and we're review, reviewing some there's about 20 of us in the room and i'm sitting next to evelyn and she, they we're looking at stuff on tv about scoop marks and she looks at my right wrist i don't know you can't really see it but uh, you can't really see it here but anyhow on my right wrist is a scoop mark, identical to the one I got when I was five years of age. Now, the only reason I mention that is because when I was five, my dad was the chief of police where I lived. So he took me for a walk. It was about 10 o'clock at night. And I looked over to this place called the Slave Dump. It's next to California, PA. And now they have an 84 lumber on it, but it wasn't back then. And I saw this large object. It was about 100 feet in diameter. It was uh, sort of like a fluorescent type of light. And I said, Daddy, what is that? He goes, don't say anything about it. It's nothing. I thought that was kind of strange because my dad taught me investigative technique. And he's a police officer. Why would he even say that? Anyhow, so keep that in mind. So I get these scoop marks. So anyhow, they set up a, uh, a hypnotic regression on me. Well, before they weren't going to do that, Devin and I go back up to the ridge. So we're sitting up here. And I got to tell you something. This is kind of funny. My wife will tell you, I don't like mustard. Well, I didn't back then. <laughs> so right. I eat mayo on everything. Anyhow, so we go. I'm the same there. way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I'm sitting in, and we're sitting at this old West church facing this hillside. Now, behind us is big. This is all farm areas and stuff. 
it's kind of developed right now, but it wasn't so much back then. So there's, uh, there's a field behind us on the other side of the road with trees. They took the trees out now, so you can clearly see the field. But anyhow, at that time, there were trees back here, so you couldn't really see what was behind us. So we're looking forward, and Devin says, John, do you want a sandwich? I said, what's on? He goes, mustard. I said, well, I'll set it on the dash. It was a fresh sandwich. Keep this in mind. Okay, so I put it on the dash, and Devin says, look over there. So we're looking about 500 feet away, and he, we see three round orbs, white, like fluorescent light again. That's the last thing I remember. That's the last thing he remembers. We wake up two hours later disoriented. We didn't know what, what had happened. So, and we finally made it back to my house because Devin lives in uh, West Mifflin. And I live in, like I said, at the time in California, PA. So he made it home. We were all dis discombobulated. So anyhow, we go back to this meeting. And after the scoop mark, Stan set up this thing with this hypnoregressionist. So I go up and I had a panic attack. I couldn't do it the first time. I don't know why. I've never had a panic attack in my life about nothing. But it was a subconscious thing that I wasn't supposed to tell anything. They set it back up again. I go back up. And while we're in this woman's house, she's really rich. Her, her husband's, uh, he designs and builds houses. You see this beautiful house he got. Anyhow, so they took, they took Devin in first. But we weren't, Devin and I weren't allowed to talk to each other for two weeks prior to these regressions on both of us. So we didn't cross-contaminate each other with anything. So I, he goes in first for about half hour. They got him under quick. They took two hours to get me under. I got a real strong will, apparently. When they did, and I started relating what I saw under hypnosis, scared the crap out of the lady doing it. She's a professional at this, okay? She refused to do it anymore. All kind of things happened that day, too, but they got on, that on tape. So they decided to set up a second regression. But this time, they did it with a Pittsburgh City police officer who specializes in forensic hypno hypnosis. He did, he, he, what he does, he enhances witnesses and victims' memories about crime. So he's done this for 30 years. His name, last name, well, I'll tell you his first name. Bill is his first name. He lives in McMurray, PA. So I go under regression. My wife and my sister-in-law are with me. He did every trick in the book to make sure I wasn't faking he had me make my arm like this, like a steel bar, and they tried to bend it. Three of them couldn't move my arm. I'm strong, but I'm not that strong. Anyhow, what I told him under hypnosis scared him. He, by the time he was done, he said, I have the tape as well. I'll make you a copy of the tape and send it to you. He said I was the genuine article. So I've been an abductee as well. Now, I know that sounds crazy. Now, 35, 40 years ago, I wouldn't even say anything about this to anybody. But this is a fact. It's been happening to me since I was five years of age. Not only me, but others. So anyhow, I got to tell you this too. So keep that in mind. Uh, in 1969, I, we had Christmas vacation. And I was still in high school. And my dad had bought me a set of walkie-talkies, pretty powerful. And he was working uh, till 11 o'clock at night as a police officer. So where I live was in a valley. And there's a big hill above me, about 800 feet high. And on top of that hill is a huge barn. So I'm standing outside about 10 o'clock at night, and I'm talking to my, my friend Jack, who lives in Long Branch, PA, and all of a sudden, for some reason, I ducked. When I ducked, I looked up, and I saw, as God is my judge on my kids' lives, I saw an object shaped like this. Oh, I'll try to do it for you. Like this, triangular, but the back was long, like, a, like another triangle on the back of it. Now, I estimated the size because of the barn on top of the hill. The length would have been about 800 feet, the width about 500 feet. It was white fluorescent, but I can clearly see the undercarriage or the different protuberances underneath of it. Now, what had happened, it hovered over me. Now, it came from the north and went to the south. It came from like Pittsburgh area to the, to the south. It, when it did, it ejected like a giant teardrop about 150 feet long, and it swung down like this into the hillside which then it zipped off. Well, I went in the house. My face was white as a ghost. My mom said, what happened? And I told her, she said, you're staying up till your dad gets home. So my dad came home. I was, I was a little guy back then. I was like five foot eight. I, I grew like, I don't know why I grew like this, but I, I got some, like I said, I'm six, four now, but anyhow. So I told <laughs> him what happened. Dad says, I said, dad, can we go up there now? He says, no, we're not going up tonight. We'll go up tomorrow. So he and I, my brother Frank, went up, and the whole hillside where this pendulum-shaped object came down was tore up. To this day, it is, and nothing grows there. 
So I didn't tell anybody else about this, just my brother and I and my dad knew. So I go back to school after Christmas vacation. Now, back in school back then, there were no locks on your doors, no security. People could just walk in and out of the school, not like today, okay? So I, I'm sitting in a study hall, and my principal, Stricter Pollock, that was his name, a heavy set bad guy, he comes up and says, Johnny, he says, there's two guys want to see you, you know, I would suggest you go in your homeroom because there's nobody there right now. Now, my homeroom faced the front of the school by the parking lot. So I'm thinking, what's well, a college recruiter? Because I, I wanted to go to college. I didn't know what I, I went to college later on, but I thought it was a college recruiter. Keep in mind, I weighed 132 pounds at five foot eight or five foot nine. So I go in there and there's two guys, both dressed in black with black hats, sunglasses, white shirts, black ties, black shoes, about five foot 10 each. So I'm sitting in the front by myself in a room. Now the door's open to the outside. So they start asking me questions about the UFO I'd seen fly over me. And it kind of threw me for a little loop because I'm thinking they're college recruiters. One would start the conversation and the other would finish it. Just like they were the same person. They were both pale complected too. Anyhow, so now they're talking about, we can put you in jail for the rest of your life. We can put you to death. You'll lose all your, your legal rights. You'll be held incommunicado. I didn't even know what incommunicado was at the time. And so I, I was getting flustered. I was scared. So here comes my homeroom teacher walking by. His name was Pete Petrov. He was six foot five, about 400 pounds. He was a football coach, too. He saw my consternation. He says, Johnny, what's going on? So I, he walked in. I said, these guys are threatening my life and my family's life. So he said, what do you guys want? So they looked at each other without a word, walked out the front of the school. We followed them out. I followed behind Pete because I was a little guy. And they got in a car. It was a Lincoln Continental Black with Air Force plates on the back of it. And they zipped out of our parking lot. Now, this has happened more than one occasion to me. Anyhow, so let's move along. We'll move forward. Well, we got a call from the Uniontown State Police and the Uniontown Police that there was a UFO site over uh, a cryogenics plant up there in Uniontown. Now, the mountain, Summit Mountain, overlooks this cryogenics plant. So this is wintertime. So Devin and I decided we're going to go up there with telescopes and equipment and look down into Uniontown from up on that ridge. Okay. So we go up there and we sat up. Now, as we're pulling, you know where Jamonville is? The Jamonville Cross. Have you ever heard of that? Uh, no, I can't. You there? Oops, sorry, I muted myself by accident. <laughs> That's okay. Well, anyhow, no. Jamonville is a church camp, and on top of the mountain there is a, it's the tallest uh, cross you ever saw, 60 feet tall, and you can see it for 20 counties away. Well, we as we're pulling into this church camp to go up to where we're going to set up, there was a, a truck there. It was a camo truck sitting there with two guys in camo gear. This is 10 o'clock at night in the wintertime. I'm in my Jeep. My Jeep goes anywhere. And I, had, I don't have it anymore. I have another SUV. But anyhow. So we go past it, and I had this eerie feeling. So I said, Devin, we're going to go down around this turn. We're going to pull off the road. So we pulled off the road, and when we did, about a minute later, here comes the truck with no lights on. Kind of spooked us, but we had, a, we had something to do. So it passed us. We go up. We set up on uh, by some microwave towers right up on the mountain. So we're sitting there. Now, there's no moon out that night. It's cold as crap, you know, up on the mountain. And we're looking down into Uniontown to this cryogenics plant. Next thing I hear is rotor wash. Now I'm looking around. I don't see any running lights or anything, but I have a Q beam. You know what a Q beam is, right? It's a 500,000 power uh, candle uh, spotlight. Okay. Yeah. I use it. I use it for deer spotting and stuff like that too. But it's really powerful. I can light up two miles away with this thing. And I had a oh, portable yeah. power. I had a portable power pack with it as well. So I'm shining a light in the air, and I spotted a UE helicopter, black with its doors open, running with no lights on at all. Down below it, it was a treetop level, by the way. Down below it was a black car, two two Humvees, and two uh, trucks, two carrier trucks, no lights on, and they're going along the ridge, Chestnut Ridge. That's a Pennsylvania's Twilight Zone. I'm sure you know about that. Oh, yeah. yeah. I've heard a lot of stories from that area. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I go up there quite a bit. And anyhow, so uh, we got spooked at this point because we didn't know what was going on. Why are they running around with no lights on with a helicopter at treetop level at night in the wintertime? Really? So we decided instead of going back down the mountain the way we came, we were going to go down through Connellsville that way. 
So we went down through there, and the next day we, we hooked up. We said, we're going to go up and talk to the guy in charge of is a, a reserve base up there. And we talked to a lieutenant colonel up there. So I, I, they let us come in. We talked to this lieutenant colonel, and he, you know, he said, look, he says, uh, I said, we saw a black helicopter. He says, we don't have black helicopters. I said, really? I said, I saw one last night up on the ridge. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, what I didn't tell him is when we went back the direction from when those vehicles came, we found tire tracks coming up behind a fence in a bunker in the ground. Oh, wow. So, was, so there's a bunker up there nobody knew about. It's a wide bunker, but the tire tracks came. You can see where they opened the gate up because there's snow, and they all came off from under the ground. So two trucks, two Humvees, and a, and a Lincoln Continental came out from there. Anyhow, so after that, we started getting some strange things happen. Now, we didn't have cell phones back, and we had a regular standard phone. Our phones, we could hear people talking on our phones. We don't have party lines like they used to have. Our mail was being tampered with and delayed. So Devin and I came up with this idea to have some kind of a code made up so we could communicate, which we did. So anyhow, we decided we're going to go back up on the ridge. So he comes back down again on a Saturday, and we go up on the ridge. While I'm gone, my wife said a black helicopter was over top of our house, just hovering above our house. And she got spooked about it, called the police. They showed up. The police, the, the helicopter was gone. About a week later, I'm in the house. Now, my wife had taken our two younger children and went up to her mother's house in the country. And my youngest son, my son, John, was with me. John Jr. was with me. And we, we heard this loud noise. So I said, John, go outside and see what's going on. Because I was in the house doing some cleaning and stuff. And my wife was away because she puts me to work. Anyhow, you know how that is, too, I'm sure. <laughs> Anyhow, so he goes out and he runs back. He says, Daddy, Daddy, there's a helicopter above our house. I go outside. This is broad daylight, mind you. I go outside. I, I went to grab my camera. They have me damn filming. So I go outside. And there's this black helicopter. It's a Yui, black, hovering just above this tree we have in our backyard, which is about 80 feet tall. And this guy sitting in the side filming our house. As soon as he saw me go out there and raise the camera, I didn't have anything in it. He took off. They took off. This is this has happened several times. Okay, so this is the, some of the stuff we deal with. I mean, now I don't get spooked, but I had a, a three young children and a wife at the time that I was worried about. Okay, I didn't know what was going to happen to them and stuff. And you know, we like I said, we went out every week in Devin and I. Now let me move along and get off the UFO thing for right now. Uh, no, uh, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no I was no, just no. going to say, if, I know a lot of people are, are very intrigued and uh, or find your uh, story and everything you're sharing very interesting. Um, I do want to throw it out there. Uh, if anyone has questions, um, feel free to ask questions in the live chat. I'll be sure to direct them uh, to John. So, uh, but yeah, no, I am finding this very fascinating myself, hearing all this information. I mean, you've had a lot happen there. Um, just the iceberg, tip of the iceberg. Oh yeah. Uh, so yeah, this is good. So yeah, if you want to continue on, I just want to let everybody know if you guys have questions for John, uh, I'll try my best to uh, throw them up there for John and direct them to him. So because uh, uh, he's got a lot of information, perhaps someone that's listening has experienced something similar. Because I mean, well, I, yeah, this this is good stuff. So. Well, here's the thing. I want to tell people this. Look, there's never. I have pictures of this UFO. Now, I want to tell you something. Back in 1990, uh, Paramount Pictures contacted our group. Do you remember the movie Fire in the Sky about the Travis Walton abduction? Oh, yeah. I remember when I watched that. That was actually, it had me on the edge of my seat. <laughs> well, I'll be honest with you. Paramount Pictures asked our group to endorse the movie. In return, we were allowed to take and have a display. We went up on a Thursday night in Monroeville, PA, to watch the preview movie. And out in the lobby, we had our we had uh, plaster casts of Bigfoot. We had my UFO pictures. People were offering me five thousand dollars a piece for my pictures. Obviously, I'm not selling them, okay? But I, I kept them. I have all of them. I have seven pictures of it. And I also have the negatives of it. So, I mean, these are unretouched. It's not CGI because there was no CGI back then, okay? And like I said, anybody can sub I can subject in any scrutiny they want. OK, I don't expect anybody to. to I mean, here's here's the thing. At my age, I could care less if somebody believes me or not. It doesn't really matter to me because those in the know, people that have these things happen to them, they're listening and they understand what I'm talking about. OK, mm -hmm. they understand there's something real. 
when our government just had those hearings this past week and people came forward and talked about this stuff, that they're real, I already knew they were. And I, you know, I, I made a, p a post on Facebook about Neil deGrasse Tyson. I admire his ability in astronomy, but I, I am disgusted by his fact that he said that that distances are so vast. Keep in mind, my hobby is astronomy. I've been an amateur astronomer since I was very young. Okay. I built my own telescopes. I've ground mirror blanks and made big ones and little ones. Anyhow, he's talking about the vast distances involved. Yes, a light year, okay, and a parsec. A parsec is 3.26 light years. A light year is the t distance it takes to travel, a light to travel to 186,000 miles per second in one year, okay? Yes, they've already made the trip. They're here. They've already made the trip. They don't <laughs> have to make another trip. They made it. How did they make it? Now, that's up to open to, uh, you know, a hypothesis. Wormholes, uh, bending time and space. Who knows? But they're here. And the people worldwide have seen them. Not, we've had a president, Jimmy Carter saw him, Ronald Reagan saw him, okay? Senators have seen him, congressmen have seen him, okay? Listen, there's not only UFOs, there's USOs, okay, that people have had close encounters with, okay? Submarines have had close encounters with them, okay? They're, they're here. Now, what I, I can tell the people what I was told under hypnosis that was told to me, and I will in a minute, but I want to get on this other thing for a second. I got a call from Stan that there was a so-called Bigfoot sighting in McMurray, PA. Now, McMurray is pretty close to Washington, PA, okay? Mm -hmm. So, Devin and I go down here. We're on this case for a year. We didn't see really anything at first, but we went out there daytime one time, and it's, it, it's pretty isolated where this house is in McMurray. There's a creek, and there's a lot of hills and stuff. There was a lot of fields at the time. Now, they put condos up there, but anyhow, so... I said to Devin, I'm going to climb a tree and I'm going to stay up there. And you, you go down here with the other people that were with, with us at the time and you keep your eyes open. Well, while he was down there walking along these tracks over this hillside, some, something was throwing big boulders at him. Devin's a big guy. So he radios me and I said, well, I don't hear anything yet. So I, at that point, I'm 25 feet up in this tree and I look down and I see two green eyes looking at me from 25 feet up. So I, what do you think I did? I shimmied down a tree as fast as I could and was gone. So we go out there the next day, but now we stay all day. Now, this case was published in Fate Magazine, February 1993-94. After our, one of our last visitations there, we're, I'm walking out of the woods. Devin and the other people saw a seven and a half foot, approximately in height, Bigfoot following me out of the woods. This was published in Fate Magazine, again, 1993-94. You can check it out. So... Oh, that's, that's the other phone. Go pay attention to it. But anyhow, uh, so anyhow, I get back from that investigation that night. Now it's, it's winter time. And it's, before we had cell phones, I go to the house and my wife says, John, the chief of police in California, PA, wants you to come up to high school Hill. I said, what's going on? He says, he didn't want to talk about it over the phone, but he's pretty upset. I said, okay, I'll go up. Now it had snowed that day, but there was no snow on the road. And it was pretty cold. So I go up there and there's 12 police officers from four different municipalities and 30 civilians standing on the right side of the road going up this hill. Now it's below the high school. It's pretty, it's a lot of woods around there too. It's a lot, a lot of woods around there. So I said, what's going on? And he says, look up there. And there's a high tension tower. Now it's about 200 to 250 feet away. I saw something leaning against a high tension tower. No light out that night. I mean, it was dark. I have my Q beam with me. I said, well, let's go. So I walk up over this embankment to walk up to where it's at. And I look back and no police officers following me. I said, you guys coming or what? And they go, look at the size of that thing. I said, you guys got guns. The only thing I had on me was a stun gun at the time. Because at the time I was a site supervisor, I used to carry a lot of money, up to $4 million from our company, you know, cashier's check. Anyhow. <laughs> but anyhow, so I said, well, I'm going. So I walk up and I get within, I'd say, 25 feet of this thing at first. And I can clearly see what it is. This thing, look, I'm not short. You can't tell from what I'm saying. I'm slouching in this chair for one thing right now. This thing, I barely came to its waist. Shoulders wider than my SUV. Stunk to high heaven. Dark brown and reddish hair. Okay. Covered this thing. Massive shoulders. Massive, massive. Arms like tree trunks. Legs like tree trunks. Had its arms semi-folded. I'll try to show you. 
sort of like this. Almost no neck, no sagittal crest, like a gorilla. Keep that in mind. So I look at it and I get, well, I start walking a little closer. Here. I didn't feel any fear of it or menace from it. And I didn't feel it was afraid of me at all either. It could have ripped my arms and legs off and floss his teeth for that matter. But mm -hmm. anyhow, and I'm a strong guy. But so I get within 15 feet or so and it looks down at me. And it kind of tilts its head like this and it's studying me. Now I shine the light at it. And when I did, the light was really strange. Now, when you shine the light at something, what happens? It reflects, doesn't it? Yeah, most of the time, yeah. Okay, when I shined that light on its fur, it was it absorbed the light. Okay? I also shined the light in its eyes. Now, I want to tell you something that maybe you do or you don't know. You've been a Bigfoot researcher. Primates do not have eye shine. Did you know that? No, a lot of them don't. Some very few do. It depends on if they're nocturnal or not. Well, this primate had eye shine. It was green, big green eyes. This thing was about 10 feet tall because I measured it after it left against the height of the tire it was leaning against. Okay, it studied me. And what I felt, and it's kind of hard to explain. You know what infrasound is, right? Oh, yeah. Okay, well, animals like tigers and things can have this infrasound. It's below human hearing, mm -hmm. but it kind of like gets you worked up and stuff. A little, you know, feeling kind of weird. Well, what I felt from this creature when it looked at me, I didn't see, first of all, I didn't see an animal looking at me. I saw sentience looking at me. I saw something with intelligence looking back at me. It studied me. It wasn't afraid of me. And I wasn't afraid of it. I should have been, but I wasn't. Like I said, I faced death a lot of times. So it studied me for about 20 seconds. In three steps, it covered 30 feet faster, I swear, faster than a rabbit or a deer I've ever seen. Like a, from a standing start to looked like 60 mile an hour, three steps, 30 feet into the woods. I could hear it crashing through the wood. So I tried to get after it. Nothing happened. I measured its footprints. Now, I had melted out a little bit, but the footprints were about 22 inches long. I figured oh, wow. that they were huge. This thing was 10 feet tall. And, and so I did a soil compaction device on it the next day because I had no equipment with me because I didn't know why I was there. It indicated a weight around between 1,100 and 1,200 pounds. That's bigger than a grizzly bear. That's mm -hmm. like a brown bear, okay? Anyhow, so I go back to the house. The police officers wrote a report on it. It's on file down there. Anybody wants to check it out because it was all, we had over 500 sightings at this point. I was getting calls from Uniontown State Police, Connellsville Police, everywhere in the area, Brownsville Police, California Police. In fact, uh, the chief of police in California was making his rounds on Route 43 in broad daylight and saw one of them squatting on, alongside of Route 43, watching traffic, for crying out loud. Now, this isn't far from that ridge where the UFO was, okay? Now, so the next day, Channel 2 News, Mary Rob Jackson calls me up. She's a friend of mine. And she says, Mr. Well, she wasn't at the time. But she says, Mr. Stasco, I understand you're an investigator for you know, paranormal. I said, yeah. She says, look, we've had some sightings of Bigfoot in a place called Crescent Heights. Can we come down, pick you up, and take you up to the site? I says, sure. It had gone down with the wind chill to 40 below the next morning. So I'm wearing a one-piece black snowmobile suit, dressed heavy with moon boots for work. So they came down. There was three people in the vehicle. There was her. She's just a tiny thing, like five feet tall. The cameraman and the driver and myself. So we drive to Crescent Heights. Now, this is a town primarily, most people who live there are black. There's a few whites, but mostly black. But their church is up on top of a hill a look overlooking their, their town. It's not that big of a town. It's just a little tiny thing, uh, Granville Hollow. So we go up there, and there's already other people up there. And there's two sets of tracks up there. The tracks were about 10 to 12 feet apart. That's a big stride. Now, mm -hmm. I don't, I, you look like you're about 6'3 or so. Are you, You're pretty tall, aren't uh, you? Yeah, I'm right about 6 foot tall. Okay, well, you're for a 6 foot human being, your normal stride is 24 inches. That's to heel mm -hmm. the toe. For me, mine's about 26 or so, 26 and a half. This stride was between 10 and 12 foot. But here's the kicker. There's two sets of tracks, 22 inches, 18 inches, walking side by side. The bigger set was on the lower part of the hill. We followed them to the edge of the hill where they squatted down. We saw their butt prints in the snow. Now, Mary Rob and I both tried to jump between the tracks. We couldn't do it. And I'm tall. I couldn't make, I couldn't even make the leap. That's how far apart they were. But here's the, here's the thing. When I did a soil compaction check on it, the big set of tracks 
between 11 and 1200 pounds. The small set, now listen to this, on the one leg was 800 pounds. Mm. On, the, uh, on the other foot was 1,000 pounds. Why do you think that is? Because uh, of the, the way the ground was? The... It's carrying something. What's it carrying? It weighs 200 pounds. Uh, oh, probably a, a young one, yeah. A 200-pound young one. That's a big young yeah. one. <laughs> yeah. So, but, so, but it indicated it was carrying something. So I followed the tracks. And they actually backtracked. They stepped in their own tracks. You can actually see the, the heels and the toes. And they backtrack in their tracks. And I follow the tracks. That's how some, These are smart creatures. These are not stupid. These aren't animals. These are sentient beings of some type. So see, I've heard, other, I've heard other I've heard other people suggest that. Yeah, what no, with what you just said, I've heard other people suggest that that you said they backtrack in their own tracks. Like basically yeah. if they go somewhere and it and it stops, they turn around and go back the other way. Right. Yeah, but they, they step back. They step backwards into this track, so you can clearly see where the, the heel print was deeper than the front then. Okay. Interesting. So the, right now, here's the thing. I followed. Now it was 40 below at the time with the wind chill. I followed them up, and I found hair samples up in the tree, which I later turned into California University, and they checked it out for me. It took them about two weeks to get back. I mean, they back then they didn't have the DNA like they do the capabilities now. But they did come back and say it was an unknown primate. The hair samples were clear, too. They weren't like you would think, with a, a little bit of color around the edge, but they were clear, not like any animal, Kinda, any mammal, okay? When you say clear, would you say they were like they were more hollow? More hollow, yes. And it, which, yeah, they were, which would explain what you talked about when you shine the light on that big one. Exactly. The translucent Absor hair. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, absorb the light. Now, here's the thing. Now, I, I, I went to Brownsville, Pia. We had a case up in, you know where Patsy Hillman Park, you're going to, right? Yeah. I, yep. I know where it's, I was just up there last week. In fact, I think I'm going to go there too. It's not far from where I will, uh, maybe five miles from where I used to live. Anyhow, there was a priest that lived up there. He called us and he said, he put out trash the night before. And in the trash, he threw out some pizza in a box. Now, don't laugh, but he saw a family of Bigfoot rooting through his trash and taking the pizza. Oh, Wow. Right. This is yeah. a priest, so I have no reason to doubt his veracity, okay? We've had, I went to Connellsville. We had the state police up there call us and say that there was sightings up the stone quarry up on, on a, like a mountain up there. So Devin yeah. and I went up, there's a stone quarry. I went into that stone quarry with Devin. We had to drive, it was a really rough road, but we got up in there. Yeah, and I think I, I've been up by there. Yeah, when I was up there a few weeks ago, um, yeah, I, some friends of mine took me over to over in the area. We went to Bud Murphy's restaurant to eat. So, <laughs> okay, yeah. So, so yeah. I, yeah. So, yeah. So okay. We had, over, we had over 500 sightings of Bigfoot at that point all around the area and stuff. Now, let me tell you something. I've seen Bigfoot three times. I've seen a 10 footer, a seven and a half footer. And my wife and I saw an eight footer by Cooper's Rock State Park when we went down there last summer. Standing just in the tree line off the road as you're going up that long grade on the right side. She saw before I did. Okay. Three times in my life. Now, the, now here's the thing. You got a lot of, and look, and I'm not trying to knock anybody. that's serious about this stuff. Like I don't, I'm not knocking, knocking you either because I know you're serious. Or I wouldn't, if I didn't think so, I wouldn't be on your show. But anyhow, the thing is this, you got a lot of people out there calling themselves Bigfoot experts. Oh yeah. Okay. I, I can't, they call me experts in my group, an expert in my groups. Listen, that's fine. I appreciate that sentiment. I'm just an explorer like you are. I don't know what they are exactly. I know what they're not. They're not a gigantopithecus, which is an extinct ape from the Pleistocene era, which was 10 feet tall, because they have no sagittal crest, for one thing. And they were, they, even though those, those uh, giant apes were omnivores, so is Bigfoot. Now, we know of cases where Bigfoot runs down deer breaks its leg and kills it, mm -hmm. okay? But I got to tell you something. The Eastern Bigfoot is different from the more feral Sasquatch in the Northwest, and I'll tell you why. I, I believe that, yeah. Now, here's the thing. Now, my my, uh, my co-admin in our the group, I think I can mention on your show, can I? Yeah, you can mention anything you like. Yep. Okay, well, I'm an admin on Sasquatch Odyssey, and my, my co-admin, Brian Sharp, Brian King Sharp is going to British Columbia, on an expedition 
So, and we're wishing well because, but he's never seen one either. But he's hoping to see when he thinks there's one on his property. He lives in North Carolina. But anyhow. Yeah, I was invited to go to a British Columbia expedition, but I had to turn it down. <laughs> well, here's the thing. Yeah, I know it's expensive. But here's the thing. I actually talked to the man that gives tours up there. His name's Seward. He's an Eskimo by, by birth to give a free tour to, to Brian. Okay. So yeah, I know. Yeah, I know who you're talking about. He's a good guy. Yeah. Yeah, he yeah. is a really good guy. He just had a death in his family. You know, God bless him. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but anyhow, like I said, these creatures are real. Now, I want to tell you something else. Now, I'm, this is where I tie in the UFO connection and the Bigfoot connection. I've been on cases. I haven't personally seen it, but I've been on cases where people have seen Bigfoot in close proximity to a grounded or hovering UFO or going into or coming out of a, a UFO. What's going on here? There's some, now, I'm not the only one who says this. Now, people right. say these, people say these are interdimensional beings and stuff. But listen, let me tell you something. Back in the Pleistocene era, we had megaflora and megafauna. Giants, ground sloths were 20 feet tall. We had saber-toothed tigers, saber-toothed lions. We had dire wolves. You know, it was real. And we had the worst thing of all was the giant cave bear, the short-faced bear. When the humans crossed the Bering Sea on that land bridge, they were eat, a lot of them were eaten by this bear because it could outrun a horse. Okay. Now, if I were an alien race and we were physically and they were physically and we were physically weak, we would probably, if we wanted to explore this world at that time, we might want to bring in something that can help us do so. Well, Bigfoot mm. seems to be arboreal in nature. It has super strength. We know it can climb. Okay, so if it climbs, that must be a reason to climb too. But on its native world, it's not the top predator, just so you know. Anything that climbs is not the top predator. Think about that for a second. Top hmm. predator. Grizzly bears can't climb trees. Right? They're too Brown big, bears, yeah. <laughs> well, they're claws. It's their claws. Mm -hmm. they, and they run faster downhill than they run uphill. I'm sorry, they run faster uphill than they do downhill. Right, they, right, they, yeah. Now, black bears can climb trees. Okay, mm -hmm. Kodiak bears cannot climb trees. Okay, anyhow. So if you're an alien and, you, and you're weak physically and you wanted to explore this planet, you bring something in to help. Well, Bigfoot was suited for that environment at that time. Think about it. Okay. Native Americans talk about the giants back then, the, the hairy man of the forest. You know about mm -hmm. these, all these stories. Okay. They talk about it. They call Some call them a brother. Sometimes they say that it would snatch children or women. Okay. Mm -hmm. But getting back to what I was saying about the feral nature of the Northwest run. The, the North, there was a place called Portlock, Alaska. I'm sure you've heard of that. Mm -hmm. where it was a, a mining town, and people were turning up mutilated, torn to pieces and stuff. It got so bad that the people evacuated the town, never went back. Okay? Now, there was also some film footage here. Now, about two years ago, I saw it on, I think it was a Discovery Channel, where they showed a Bigfoot-type creature throwing a log about 20 feet. A big log. <laughs> So these creatures in the Northwest are more feral. They don't like their territorial in nature. They hunt and kill anything. But let me go back to the East Coast ones where we're at. I've never heard of a case in this, in this, on the East Coast anywhere of a Bigfoot killing a cow or a sheep or anything like that. Maybe a dog or a cat, but never a cow or sheep. Why? Mm -hmm. Well, the East Coast Bigfoot has learned to cohabit within suburban and suburban areas. Because mm -hmm. it knows man's, it knows man's weapons, it knows man's dogs. Okay? So it leaves the cows alone. And, and we have a lot of deer around here. My God, we had a deer give birth on this porch a couple of years ago. We have deer right across the street hanging out all the time. They're walking down the street in Washington, PA. Okay? Real, it's crazy. I've never seen so many deer in my life. But anyhow, they know they can't be hunting in the, in the, in the park up here or in the town or in the cemeteries. So we have a lot of them. Anyhow, but they, they primarily... They're omnivores. They eat mm -hmm. uh, berries. They eat different types of, of fruits and things of this nature. And they eat deer and small animals, okay? But they don't mess with man's domesticated animals of that type, like the, like the cow or whatever. They leave them alone. So they've learned to cohabit. When I told you the earlier story, the one in McMurray, P, that's like 12 miles from Pittsburgh, for crying out loud. That's yeah. the second biggest city in the state. Right. Okay? And McMurray is, is bustling with businesses and everything else. There's houses around there. It's all grown up now, stuff like it was. But, I mean, this, I mean, California PA is a 
it's not as big as Washington, but we have a university down there. We have other things. We have businesses all over the place and stuff. And it's, it was below the high school. So these things I found, now I'll give some advice. People set up trail camp. They set them up about five to six feet off the ground. Big mistake. Don't do that. Set them up about 12 feet. 12 feet, yeah. I was going to say higher, yeah. 12 feet. And what you do, what I've learned is there's a lot of power lines around here, okay? And we have a lot of mines around here from coal mines that are abandoned. What you do, you take on, like if you're going through a, a right-of-way for a power line, you stagger them. And they're look, so they're looking at each other, okay? So if anything walks past you, past you you're going to get it. The other thing I learned about Bigfoot is they like to walk in creeks. Listen to this. I found tracks of Bigfoot tracks coming out of a creek. But what they do, they have such a long stride, they're not just going to step right onto the shore. They step far onto the shore. But they use the creek beds, which were plenty around here, to cover their tracks on land. Because there's no tracks in the creek bed, right? Water's running over it. Right. So you, watch, so you do that. The other thing is, is I noticed too, you're, I know I'm pretty sure you're a hunter. I used to be with a gun. I don't hunt with a gun anymore. I hunt with a camera. But uh, that's another story too. But anyhow, <laughs> what, when you go into the woods, what I, my grandfather taught me, my uncles taught me how to hunt. And they said, Johnny, when you first go into the woods, you go in and you make as much noise as you can. Go in about 200 yards or so and find a tree and put your back against the tree and face the direction you just came from. And the reason why is because deer will circle back around. And I've, every year I've gotten a deer. Every year I got a deer. I'm going to have to keep that in mind. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it actually works. They do. They'll back circle around. Okay, they come back around. And every year I got a deer. The other thing is when I was young, uh, where I lived, there's a lot of cornfields. And the farmers would call me up and say, John, can you do me a favor? I said, sure, what's up? Can you come up? We have a deer problem up here in our corn crop. I might, I might kill 20, 25 deer a year. I used to give the meal, the meat away. I take it down to Fredericktown butcher shop and I tell the guy down, you can have the hide and the horns and half the meat if you process the other half and give it to me. And I did. I gave some to my family and other people I knew and, and donated the rest. But all, every year, every year. Uh, but this, that, I mean, so that's some, just some tips, but you got to be quiet in the woods. Now they have shows on TV where they have, look, you're taking a camera crew out there at night Keep in mind that Bigfoot can see in a different spectrum as we can, based on my knowledge, my experience. They can see in a different spectrum than we can as well. We have we have a very narrow, narrow spectrum that human beings see, and you know that, okay? Mm -hmm. For instance, an owl can, has a thousand times better sight than we do, an owl. I, I would surmise that Bigfoot probably has something close to that. They have super hearing. They're smart. They can cover more ground quickly, more quickly than we can, okay? They can move stealthily. They're like the, the, the kingpins of uh, hide and seek. Okay. So you got to be quiet when you go in the wood. You sit still. I used to go with my dad when he was a constable. And we'd sit for hours waiting for a guy so we could arrest him. <laughs> I learned that <laughs> from my dad. So I could sit for I could sit for eight hours. Just sit for eight hours and not make a move. But you gotta you have to go out into the woods and stuff. Now, this will bring me to something I said the other day on your, and I apologize for this, by the way, because I didn't quite clarify what I was meaning. We have a lot oh, of people. Oh, yeah. We have a lot of people nowadays that write books <laughs> about UFOs and Bigfoots, and they call themselves experts. Again, there is no such thing in a field. None. We're I agree. All yeah. We're all explorers and seekers of the unknown. We're mm -hmm. trying to make it known so we can help people. You're doing it because you started this for the love of it. You're not getting paid to do this stuff. I don't want right. you because you have a limited income to do these things, to go out. But you're out there every day. I'm out. Well, right now I can't because, uh, well, I have a great granddaughter uh, suffering from cancer. She's eight years old. She had an inc incurable form of cancer. My wife and I have been helping out my granddaughter, her mother, and her other children for quite a while now and stuff. In fact, we went to a fundraiser today or we up at the park where they had a, a Michael Jackson impersonator there. It was pretty funny. But oh, was, wow. That was pretty good. But anyhow, we've had several fundraisers. She seems to be doing good. She went through radiation and all that stuff. But anyhow, so I don't fault people like yourself for doing it. But I was supposed to, I was going to go up to uh, the Kecksburg UFO Festival this year. And I called the director 
the one organizer. I won't mention him by name because I'm a little bit perturbed with him. And I said, I'd like to be listed as a speaker. Now, last year I went up and I wasn't listed as a speaker. And it was like 90 degrees out. We, they had it inside of their, their building. And there was like 300 and some people in there. And there were six guys in front, including this guy. And they were selling, they were pumping their books. Okay. Some of them might have gone into the woods a few times. But they're not boots on the ground like you and me. They're pumping their books to make money. Now, at the end of that session last year, they asked if anybody has anything to say, please stand up. Well, I did for 25 minutes. By the time I got done, I got a standing ovation. Wow. Because I was telling people how it is, and I was trying to help people who have had experiences like that. I'm not trying to sell anything. For years, my wife and others have tried to get me to write a book, but I've been on 5,000 cases in my life. You name it, I've been on them. Okay. I started it, but I, I don't know if I'm going to finish. But if I do, I'm donating all the procedures to the Cancer Society, every penny of it. Awesome. Good it'll for you. Be, yeah. It'll be my first and only book because I had cancer. My grand, great granddaughter has cancer. Okay. I got mine differently, as I explained earlier. But mm -hmm. the thing is, this is I take great umbrage at those who are trying to make money off this genre, who don't know what they're talking about, who haven't put one boot in the wood, who live off the hard work of everybody else. I don't begrudge anybody making some money, but don't tell me you're an expert and try to shut everybody else down who wants to come forward with their story. This year, they told me that no one was allowed to speak at the end of their presentation to sell their book. Now, next year, I promise you I'm going out. And I will speak one way or another. And I will take up some information to give people, including business cards. If they want to contact me, fine. I've never made a penny off anything I ever did. I did a speaking engagement for Boru up in Butler here last summer. I didn't charge him a penny. That's up in Lindor. For, I'm a member of the Agents of the Unexplained, too, run by Bill Ritchie. Oh, good guy. Yeah. Yeah. I know him very well. Good friend. Good, yeah. Good guy. I also mm -hmm. went up to, this year, I went up to Chestnut Ridge to the Bigfoot Outpost run by Bill Apple. And I put mm -hmm. his stuff on Facebook to help him get his business going. In fact, there's a picture of me standing next to an eight-foot tall one he has there. It's actually pretty lifelike. Oh, I want to say something about Bigfoot, too. I've oh, yeah. Of, I've seen a lot of renditions about the face of Bigfoot. First of all, there's not that much hair on the face. It's clear. Pretty much clear down to here. There's a little bit around the edges and on the chin. But it's pretty clear, and it's a dark. It's almost like a grayish color. That's what it is. Now the rest of it's pretty hairy, long hair. I mean, the hair samples that I got were about, I'd say, 14 inches long or so. But you oh, can wow. clearly, see, yeah, they, you can clearly see the musculature underneath of it, and it stunk like. How can I say this? I'll try to be nice about it. it smelled like dung. It smelled like death, like dead animals. It smelled like like the sulfur, like the worst smell you could ever think mm -hmm. of. So, I mean, there's a scent to it. So if it has pheromones, maybe it can be deter detected with a pheromone detector. Okay? I don't think anybody's ever come up with that idea. Now, there's been subjects made up, brought up about using drones. I think drones are a good idea. Because, mm -hmm. especially the ones with FLIR capability. Because they can move a lot faster than we can on foot. Okay? Now, game trails are a big thing. If we go on game trails to find animals to hunt or whatever. Bigfoot's going to use those same game trails or just off those game trails to hunt deer, rabbits, or whatever other game it wants to get. So game trails, you set up cameras along game trails. You set up cameras along creek beds. Not just one or two game, game cameras, but series six, seven, eight of them if you can afford it. Okay. You, you also, when you go into the woods, you don't take a big party into the woods. But I would say this. You would take two people. If you have 10 people that want to go, you take two and split them into five groups of two. You have four people at base camp. Make sure you have somebody there that's familiar with CPR, things of this nature. Somebody's medically trained in some way in case you, somebody gets injured. And the reason I say two people each in case you get, say you break your leg or your ankle and you're up there way up in the woods somewhere. You could die from hypothermia before anybody could find you. Okay. So you want to have that. Now, there's also people that take guns into the woods hunting for these creatures or having them there. I, I'm kind of torn with that. I'll tell you why. It, if, you shoot a, if you shoot a bear and wound it, what happens? And it gets away, what happens? Uh, he's going to circle around and come back and hunt you down. And uh. if he can't find you, what's he going to do? 
you're going to find somebody. No, oh, yeah. Right? Uh, I, I, I know a story happened just up the road for me, probably some year, uh, probably maybe 10 years ago, it, between eight and 10 years ago, up on the base of the mountain, there was a group of hunters, big, big old bear. I mean, they end up, uh, one, one guy ended up shooting and wounding it. He split off from his group. His group was, I forget how far off, but he was by himself. That bear circled back around and ended up coming down to uh, attack him. Luckily, the other guys weren't entirely all too far off. They were able to come by and finish a, the bear off. But, yeah, they had a picture of that bear in front of that big old backhoe bucket. That was huge. <laughs> but that guy was very lucky. His friends were nearby. So, yeah. Well, that kind of brings <laughs> up an old a memory I had when uh, when my mom and dad had us there were five of us children uh there was me as the oldest and my brother frank my brother and sister which are you know they're twins ralph and sally and my baby brother nick we're all in our 60s now i'm 70s i'll be 71 next month or week as i said my dad decides to take us up to uniontown mountains on a picnic well back then they hadn't developed it like it is now they have all kinds of stuff up there well there was a pull off up there so my dad pulled off, and it was an old rickety picnic table. So my mom and dad decided to set it up. So Frank and I went exploring. We went about 100 yards back into the woods, and there was this big gully about 500 feet long. So we crawled down in this gully, and it's dark in there and stuff. But my brother says, John, look at that big dog over there. And I look. At the end of the gully, I said, that's not a dog. That's a bear. We start running. For my, you know, We're screaming for my dad. We're young. I was like 10. Frank was 9. So we're running and we're still bear, daddy, bear. Anyhow, so we now bear cannot run a human being. It cannot run a horse for short distance. Anyhow, by the time we got back, my dad had everybody in the car, including my mom. He's standing with his police revolver, a 38 loaded like this. He, the door was open. He said, get in. We got in. He shut the door. Six shots it took to kill this bear. Point blank. He shot him. My dad was really good with a pistol. I was better with a rifle, but he was great with a pistol. Right there in the Utah mountains and stuff. Not I've killed three bear in my life, you know. But like I said, I don't hunt anymore for, for that. I, I'm, I wasn't a sportsman, per se. I didn't go for racks of the size of the rack on a deer. Or, I went for meat. That's what I was, you know. And I, I don't, never considered myself a sportsman. I could care less about that. But, yeah, I. Uh, but about the Bigfoot. Like I said, Bigfoots don't have – they, they, they have eye shine. Most primates do not. They don't have a sagittal crest like a gorilla, so they're not a primate like we know. Now, I don't know if you know, but but there's a there was a race of hominids called the Denisovan. Have mm -hmm. you ever heard of it? Oh yeah, Denisovan, yeah. They were large, large man-like hominids. They were about eight feet tall. They were pretty. Now, there I don't know whether they could be descendants of Denisovans or not. But I can tell you this: these are intelligent creatures. Now, there's a state out west. I believe it's Utah. They put a bounty on it for, I think it's a million dollar bounty. It's one of those states out west that if you kill a Bigfoot, you get a million dollars. I'm against that. Now, some people in this genre say, well, without a body, there's no proof. Listen, out of the 17,000 cases that have been reported, if only one of them is true. That means they're all true, right? If one person hmm. sees it out of 17,000, then it means it exists, right? They exist. It, yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, no, I got to say this, too. We have a lot of people posting, like, really blurry pictures of stuff on Facebook and on other groups. Look, you'll see a face in there. Well, I got news for it. I look at them real carefully because I, when I'm an admin on a group, I, when I don't see anything, it's gone. It's off the page. You know, and mm -hmm. same thing with tree falls. You've been in the woods how many times, Daniel? You see that there are natural tree falls that make tree. I mean, they can make any kind of structure. Now, when you, right. have a big tree, when you have a big tree that's turned upside down and stuck in the ground, that's a different ball game. When you have a shelter made, that's a different ball game as well. So, but you know, so not every every noise you hear in the woods is a Bigfoot either. I don't. I mean, I hate to knock the group, but there's a another Bigfoot group, and I'm not going to mention the, the group's name or the man because I don't want to disparage him. Because I think, by and large, you're trying to get some information. But every noise he hears in the woods is a Bigfoot. That's a Bigfoot. No, it's not. There's there's noises in the woods. There's trees rubbing together and branches breaking all the time. You oh, absolutely. You know, we had a coyote last last year. I was sitting in my SUV out in front of my house here, 
and it was hot as, as you know what, outside. And I saw, I'm looking out the car, and I see this thing walking down the street. It wasn't a dog. It had no hair on it, mangy, narrow hips and stuff. My first thought was, looks like a chupacabra. Oh. It, it turned out it was a mangy coyote with rabies. Oh, wow. And, and <laughs> okay. Now, if I were to tell you this, people don't want to believe in Bigfoot. But let me ask you this. And I know you already know the answer, but I'm going to say it anyhow. If I were to tell you, Daniel, that there's a creature that has a bill of a duck, a tail of a, a, a beaver, has hair, lays eggs, has claws, with, which are poison, you say what? Bullshit, right? I was going to say that. Yeah, I was going to say, wait a minute. I was really thinking on that one. <laughs> it's, a platypus, oh. it's, a, it's a platypus. A platypus. platypus. See, I don't, I don't know nothing about. I, yeah, I know they have the beak and everything. They look similar. They have a similar appearance to a beaver, but I was like, I didn't know they laid eggs. So yeah. they lay so. They lay eggs. They're marsupial. They lay eggs. They have a tail of a beaver. Their claws have poison on the tips. Okay. And oh, and see, I, I didn't know. That's interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, well, you know, they're trying to bring back the Tasmanian wolf too, or Tasmanian tiger, I should say. They're also right. trying to bring. They're trying to bring back the mastodon by mixing its genes from the DNA they got from the ones frozen in Siberia with the Indian elephant, which is a closer relative than the African elephant. So there's a, they're trying to bring things back. They just found a worm that was released after 46,000 years in the ice came alive. Okay. Hmm. Antarctica is melting right now. And there's a lake down there that the Russians found. There's all kind of bacteria and things down in that lake that's been frozen for hundreds of thousands of years underneath there who knows what's going to come out of there? what kind of bacteria you gotta remember human beings they've technically speaking hominids have been around about three hundred thousand years but man cro or man as we know cro magnet and us homo sapiens has only been around probably 50 60 thousand years or so so who knows what's underneath the ice it's melting now mm -hmm. but well yeah there's all i'm i'm learning like I checked the news feeds and stuff on, you know, on, on the internet. And I mean, in various locations, there's, yeah, different species that are being discovered. I mean, species that we knew that used to exist that, that we learned about, but yeah, I mean, there's always some kind of new, dis uh, new discovery of some kind of remains. Uh, some of these remains of either, either you know, we either to be a, a, a dinosaur or some, I mean, some of these remains are, depending on how they died off, some of their remains uh, of their carcasses are, per, some of them are pretty well, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, intact. I mean, yeah, preserved. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I mean, so yeah, there's a lot of interesting things happening a lot, you know, so. Well, here's, here's the other yeah. thing. You know, we have in our oceans too, we have uh, creatures, like they found uh, a six-gilled shark down here. Back in the uh, not too long ago, they found there's a there was a fish from the uh, the uh, prehistoric fish called the coelacanth. The coelacanth was supposed to be extinct for 65 million years. They found three of them alive so far. Three coelacanth. Hmm. It's an armored bony fish. From I think I yeah. I think I know what you're talking about. I might have seen something about that. Yeah. The other thing is this: there was a picture taken from the, by the Germans during the Second World War. When uh, German U-boats were out in the ocean on their, their patrols, they, they would get mail and supplies brought to them by another U-boat. They showed a picture of a fin of a shark about eight feet tall passing between the two submarines. Now, that brings up this, the question, is there a megalodon still alive? We don't know what's in the bottom of the ocean. It's seven miles down. Oh, that's the Challenger Deep in the, in the uh, Pacific Ocean, in the Marianas Trench. The Challenger Deep is the deepest place on Earth, seven miles. The pressure is incredible. There's no light down there whatsoever. So we don't know what all is down there. So what I'm trying to get at is this, you know, like, for instance, too, I'm going to say this. Until the, like the 1900s or so, we didn't know anything about the mountain gorilla. Right. Okay. We, it's bigger than a lowland gorilla. Okay. It lives up there on the mountain, but it's, it's bigger. I've actually seen them in person, in fact. Uh, when I was a kid, they used to have them wrestling up here and trying to fight human beings and stuff, but they banned that stuff years ago when I was a kid. Believe it or not, and orangutans too. I saw a guy get beat half to death by a orangutan. But anyway, gonna, oh my goodness, yeah, they'll they'll pull you pull your limbs off left and right. <laughs> yeah. well, they, this, yeah. this guy was this one man was a marine. He went into this surround cage, 
and I was I was in high school. I came up with my friends up to the Washington County Fair back then, and they had this round cage, great big round cage, and they said they'll give two hundred dollars to anybody to go in there and survive against this orangutan. Orangutan is about five feet tall, but has seven foot arm span. Red orangutan had a had a muzzle on it too, because it has big fang. This guy, this marine, he's six foot two. He walks in. He's about two hundred twenty pounds. He walks in and punches this orangutan straight in its face. The orangutan runs up the up the side of the this round cage with its feet, reaches down and grabs him and beats him half to death off the cage. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, hey. so my buddies are saying, why don't you go in there, join us? No. So we walk a little mm -hmm. further down and they had a 600 pound mountain gorilla in the cage. He's taking a truck tire and doing this with it, playing with it, bending it in half. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I don't want to mess with it. But anyway, yeah. I could, I'm getting a little off the subject here with this stuff, but today's unknowns are tomorrow's known, okay? And I guess what I'm trying to tell your your listeners and, and you know and 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 view to them so they can understand this that you it's okay to come forward nowadays, but make sure when you go to a group that you want to that's of like mind that can give you information you can go to this group that Dan runs it's a serious group like I said I wouldn't be here or our groups they're all serious groups but beware of people that want you to get out in the woods and run around with guns and are drunk half drunk and everything else because they're going to end up shooting somebody and killing somebody. Oh yeah. You know, we don't want that to happen. We don't want anybody injured, okay? And as far as I'm concerned, to kill a Bigfoot is murder because this is an intelligent being. It's not, and I don't believe for one second in, 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 it's not intelligent. It's intelligent. Now, there's been speculation whether it's an interdimensional creature but because of the way it can disappear at will, apparently. I'm on the fence about that. I, I proposed that theory years ago that it might, could be possibly interdimensional, but I think more or less it's not so much interdimensional it's just, just very good at what it does i mean it can camouflage itself pretty darn good i mean it can sit still for hours and not move but it's been seen enough that people around the world have seen it the yeti the yaren okay you have the yowie in australia you have yeah, the sasquatch out west you have the bogey monster bogey creek monster you have the skunk ape in florida i mean they're all over the place then we have the eastern mm -hmm. bigfoot so you can't discount anything, but before people jump to conclusions, I would suggest a couple things. If you see something and you can get a picture of it, great. If you're out there and you, it, it walks away or whatever, don't try to approach it because it, it can, it's really powerful. Try to find, if there's a set of tracks, get somebody to come up and have a plaster cast. Me. Look for hair samples. Okay. Look for scat so we can get DNA from it. Okay. Do the investigative steps you need to do to make your account more verifiable and more valid, okay? And then share that information. Like I said, these groups that do this stuff, your groups and our other groups and stuff like this, we need to start networking with each other to share information. I don't believe in this thing where we just take and we hoard information and don't share it with everybody, okay? I, I want everybody to be safe going into the woods. I want you to use common sense technique, okay? Uh, don't approach these creatures, especially if there's young around. If they have young with them, any animal that's got young is going to be protected if they're young. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. So use your head. Don't shoot a creature unless it's sh you have no choice. If you have a gun on you, fine. I mean, the only thing I carry into the woods now, I have a million volt stun gun, one million volts. I'd probably stun myself with it if I see it came charging at me, so I didn't feel any pain because it'll tear me apart. But that's it. I don't, I don't carry any kind of weapons into the woods other than that. I mean, I might take a hunting knife or something to cut some ropes or whatever, but that's it. I don't, I mean, now out west, northwest, I think, yeah, you better take something with you because those creatures are way more feral. Yeah. So, let me, so go ahead. You have a question? Uh, no, nah, well, well, you actually, there was a couple things on there, but yeah, one of the things I wanted to make sure you talk about carrying weapons in the woods. Uh, I know in the past I've had one, maybe two people, uh, make a big deal that you know I carry a sidearm. You know uh, when I go out there, and so you know I I had to specify I had to clarify that well hey look I'm not worried about Bigfoot. Bigfoot's not why I carry a sidearm. People fail to uh, realize or understand or neglect that there's a lot of other predators in the uh, in the forest that are pretty wild that we have to be aware of. I mean, yeah, bears, I, I encountered bears on numerous occasions, but most of the time they're very skittish, the black bear anyway. They right. tend not to mess with you. 
But you never know. There, uh, you might have a, a coyote uh, or a group of coyotes that you encounter, which, you know, you just never know. I mean, because we got mountain lions, too, that people, you know, don't realize that they're here, you know. So, did you know that, did you know that there's a, uh, there was a near extinct panther, it's bl a black panther that lived on the East Coast? I've heard stories about that, and it's funny that you say that because my I had a sighting back in 2015, and it was black. You know, so I saw look. it's half the size of the American cougar. I saw mm -hmm. it when I was 12 years old delivering newspapers. 12 years old. It was about 75 pounds at the most. I thought it was a dog at first, but it was a big. It was a a, a miniature version of a cougar, but it was black. It was about half the size of a mountain lion. So yeah, they mm. exist too, but people think you know there's no such thing. How many guys do you know? Well, you live in a state where there's a lot of hunting, I'm sure. So oh, yeah. Up here, there's a lot of people up here who have never seen a coyote. Are you serious? Never, yeah, they have never seen a coyote. Oh, we've wow. Had, listen, we've had people up here. I'm going to tell you the true story. When I went hunting when I was in college, I dated this girl from uh, out near Fredericktown, and she told me they had a lot of deer out there. So I go out there, and I was, I was 16 when I started college. And I went up, I had a 303 British infield rifle with 215 grain shells. I took four with me at all times. I, I, it could hold 10 and one in a chamber. I never took that many. Are you there? Right. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Anyhow, so I go up hunting and I shot a deer and it disappeared over the hillside and I heard another shot. Two guys were up there and they shot that deer that I had shot and they were going to shoot me because they said it was their deer. I didn't argue with them. Those same two guys were going around shooting cows and sheep. They lived in Pittsburgh. They couldn't tell the oh. difference. Are you? Well, I mean, this is what's going on. They get they get that buck fever. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. So you got to be careful. And, and I don't. I mean, I understand. And you mentioned about predators. I'm going to tell you something. There was a thing I saw on Facebook a while back, and I thought it really bears repeating. They showed a picture of the world's most dangerous animal, and you look in a mirror. Man's the most dangerous mm -hmm. animal. Oh yeah, uh, absolutely. Okay, absolutely. So when you're in like walk along the Appalachian Trail, how many people were murdered along the Appalachian Trail? A lot. Oh, so, yeah, so many people go missing. Right. Yeah. I mean, we can we can talk. I mean, I could talk to you all night. I don't mean I don't know how much time we have left here, but uh, I, I just wanted to tell you some uh, something amusing. I don't know if I ever told you this before, but I got a call one time from my director that John, you're not going to believe this, but I got a call for about a vampire. I went, what? <laughs> I said, a vampire case? He said, yep, up and by Wilkes Barrel. I said, mm. by Wilkes Barrel. I said, okay, well, I'll go. So I called my friend, and he couldn't make it. He had to work. So I go by myself. This is like late October, right? So I, <laughs> what I did, I didn't know what I was going to encounter. I go up. I got some holy water. I made some steaks, okay? I took my Q-beam and a stun gun. Okay, and a Bible. So I drove all I drove all this way, and it's listen, it's thunder and it's lightning and snow and snowing all at the same time. So I get this address. It's a woman and her daughter. She's a nurse. The the daughter's 10 years old. So I go up and they live on a red dog road on a farm in a three-story brick house about a half a mile off the road. So I go up there and it's thundering and lightning now, no snow, but there's a fog about knee high to me going across. The, the land like this i mean thunder and lightning now, look i knock on the door i wouldn't have been a bit surprised if vincent price would have answered the door bella a ghost okay because it was that scary so i go in and i talk to the lady and stuff and i i asked i said look i have to take you in separate rooms i want you to draw what you saw so first i took the little girl and she drew me a picture of this thing what she saw out her three-story window the third story, mm. fourth story. Then I took the mother in another room and she drew this pretty a better rendition of it. It looked like the movie, the original movie Nosferatu. Okay, that vampire, the original one. I don't know if I've seen that one. Yeah. Well, you remember a Salem's Lot, that movie? Uh, I'm Salem's familiar with it. Yeah. Yeah, well, it looked like that kind of vampire. So I said, Where did you see this? She says, On the third floor. That's her playroom. So I went outside and I'm looking. There's a there's no trellis on the back of the house where the room is. The nearest tree is about 100 feet away. So no one climbed up that thing. Okay, there's no way to climb there. So I'm like, what the heck? So I said, now the fog's rolling across the ground, but there's no thunder or lightning out. So I go back in the house. I said to the lady, I says, what's over that hillside there? She goes, it's a cemetery. I went, what? <laughs> a cemetery? Mm. So 
So I said, okay, well, I'm going to go there. So I start, I, I'm going out and I'm, you know, I'm a little tight, you know, I'm like, like okay, what am I going to do if I encounter a real life wet vampire? Well, <laughs> I'll give it, I'll, I'll give it a fight. Cause I was pretty, I'm like I said, I'm, I was a lot younger. I'm pretty strong. So I go into the cemetery and it's an old cemetery, 1600s, 1700s. I'm like, ah, boy, fog rolling across. Like I says, I'm there about a half hour. I walk through the cemetery. I come back by now it's midnight. I get back to the house. I said, look, I'm gonna, she has a wraparound porch on the house. And there's a swing at the end of the porch. I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sit out here for a few hours. So I'm sitting out there. And she said, well, I'm going to make you a thermos of coffee. So I'm sitting out there. And I'm drinking this coffee. And I'm like, geez, what am I going to do? <laughs> okay, let me out. I'm by myself. So about an hour and a half into sitting out there, I hear this noise behind me. I'm, and it's a, pretty noticeable. And I'm like, Okay, so I hurry up and jumped and turned around. It's a deer. They had a deer <laughs> on the side of the house. I said, okay, that's enough. So I go in. I, I kind of bless the house with the holy water and all that stuff. And he never had an incident after that, by, by the way. But I believe their story because they're not going to lie. Hmm. Why would they lie? You know, I drove all that way and stuff. But that's the one and only vampire case I've ever been on. You know, but uh, I've been, I went last summer, I went to uh, Point Pleasant, West Virginia with my wife and I did my second investigation for on Mothman. I stayed three days there and I actually went into the, all the bunkers there. And for, for McClintock preserve, there should be a lot of animals in there. You would think deer and everything else, right? Oh yeah. My wife no. wouldn't get out of the, she wouldn't get out of the car. So I had a, a 40 channel CB handheld CB and she had the other one in the car. And it was working perfectly. It's nothing wrong with it. And I had this real powerful light. It's a Q beam with the four fire pack again. So I go in all these bunkers, the lights work, and then they're further out, by the way. And everything is working as I walk in these bunkers. Not one sound from any animal. But there's a swamp up there. It's green. It's got green scum or something on it. It's a big swamp. Now, I didn't see a bug. I didn't see nothing. Not a frog. Nothing. It was like dead. Nothing there. Meanwhile, while I'm there, I run into this guy. He says he's looking for his dog. It's disappeared for a couple of days. <laughs> oh, boy. I said, well, we, we'll look around when we leave here. Anyhow, so I found the, the first bunker. Now, there was a show on, I think it was on the History Channel, where a couple went down into this one bunker down there, and they claimed that there was something in there that followed them home. We had big red eyes and everything else. I went into that bunker. The minute I stepped into that particular bunker, which is the first bunker closest to the road, my CV quit working. My lights went out. Only one. Out of all those bunkers, that's the only one. So I, wa hmm. I walked around in there. I can see pretty pretty well. I walked around in there and stuff, and I didn't see or hear anything after. I came back out. I, I walked around the property and stuff, and then my wife said, we better go. But we I went there for three days in a row, just me, going into these areas. In the meantime, we go down to Point Pleasant, and my wife and I interviewed about 100 people. Out of the 100 people, 50 I'd say 50% believe there was something there, and 50% are not sure. They didn't say it didn't. 50% right. they didn't know. I went to the Mothman Museum down there too as well. You know, and then I was talking to people down there. I got people asking me for autographs and all this crazy nonsense. But anyhow, uh I had a good time. But see, over 30 years ago, like I said, I met John Keel, who wrote the Mothman prophecies, and I talked to him at length. It wasn't just about Mothman, it was about there were UFOs in that area sighted as well at the same time. So hmm. my question so my question is this, is Mothman a natural cryptid or is something else? Now, I want to tell you something. If you know, you know about birds, birds have hollow bones so they can fly, right? Mm -hmm. the, the largest flying creature that ever existed was called the Quetzalcoatlus. had a 40-foot wingspan. It was about as tall as a giraffe. It was a carnivore. It would land and would eat what it could find on the land. But it would, it would mostly glide. It would run to get it in the air and it would glide. It was a pretty. It was the biggest thing ever flew. You heard of the Thunderbirds too, I'm sure. Modern day. Oh yeah. America talk about it. They've had some sightings of stuff like that now recently too. Again, but so for Mothman to have a 10 foot wingspan or 12 foot wingspan to be able to fly, it's impossible. It's impossible. It has to have hollow bones and everything else to do that. But the what the what the witnesses have described is a solid creature with big red eyes that can fly as fast as a car can move, you know, right next to a car, supposedly a lot of these cases I've heard about. 
So I don't think it's a natural cryptid. I, I think that, I don't know if this is a dumping ground, if the Earth's a dumping ground for, for extraterrestrial cryptids or not. You've heard of the lizard man down south or the alligator man down south. Yeah, out of South Carolina, the lizard man's kind of a common thing down there. So, yeah. Right. And then you have the and then you have different types of aliens that have been seen. The reptilians are one, the Nordiques are another. I mean, I could go on. I mean, I like I said, I could talk for my wife will tell you, I can talk somebody's ear off. I jump from one subject to the one over. And oh, over. I do the same thing. Don't feel bad. You don't feel bad. You're now you, you've been amazing. All the information you've been throwing out there, the stories you've been sharing. You're covering the airtime. This is going to be uploaded on my radio platform later on, too. So this is great. Well, so. great. well you know, like I said, I want, I want people to hear in this right now to understand that I'm sympathetic. If you're genuine, what if you saw, you can contact Daniel or you can contact me. I mean, I don't care. But you, you have a right. to If you've seen something, don't feel ashamed that you've seen something, okay? Because these things exist. The thing the, What we're trying to find out as explorers of the unknown is what they are where they're from, what they want, how to protect ourselves when we go to wood, how, how to do a proper investigation. You don't, you know, you take certain things. If you're going to go look for Bigfoot, make sure you take plaster so you can make plaster casts. Make sure you take a Petri jar or plastic containers with a lid. So if you find scat, you can put some scat in there. Okay. If you, uh, you know, hair samples, anything like that, look for things like that. Look for signs. Okay. Just remember one thing. If, if you've seen them, you can bet they've seen you too. Okay? And they'll avoid you if they can. Doesn't oh, yeah. Around. And the other thing I want to say is this. One thing I noticed, if there's a lot of deer around, generally a Bigfoot's not around. Because deer will avoid a Bigfoot because they're a food source for the Bigfoot. Okay? But if there's no, if there's supposed to be deer in the area, you don't see any deer in the area, there's something there that's keeping them away. The other right. thing, just, just like with bears. During the season where berries are at the ripest, bears will come out of hibernation to pee a lot, right? Okay, well, so does Bigfoot. They travel great distances every day. Uh, Mary Rob asked me from Channel 2 what, what I thought their, their, their range might be. I said, well, a human being could probably make a 20-mile range for himself, right? That, it's possible for a human being to make 20 miles in a day. I think Bigfoot can make three times that, 60 miles a day. They don't stay for one long in one place. They move around. They're nomadic in that regard because they don't want to be found or discovered. And if they young, have young, even more so. I think the smaller Bigfoot, the less than eight foot tall ones, the six and a half, seven foot tall ones are juvenile, young juveniles. They're more prone to be seen because they're more reckless, just like human children are more reckless. Okay. There have been cases where the a big, a big Bigfoot, nine, ten footer, has basically disciplined a juvenile. Okay, trying to teach it the ways of man, I guess, or whatever, protect itself. They're intelligent creatures. They're not, again, they're sentient creatures. I believe, just from looking in these creatures' eyes, you know, I've seen deer. I've looked deer in the eyes. And, you know, deer have a sort of type of intelligence. Rabbits do, too. They know what to avoid, pretty much. I mean, but you see a lot of rabbit carcasses on the road and possums and raccoons, right? Oh, you yeah. Deer, you see deer. You, you see deer carcasses all the time on the road. My deer, uh, my at one first SUV got hit with a deer. So, but how many big would have been hit? My brother told me one day about, oh, maybe 10 years ago up on Route 43 that there was a car wreck. And when he went up there, he was coming from work one night late. And he said there were police and state police all around. And it was the front end of a car was smashed up. And they were taking the body of what looked like a Bigfoot away. And that body was never heard from again. Wasn't a human that was hit. Wasn't a deer that hit this car, but it was taken away by the state police in a in an ambulance and taken away. What was it? I don't know. I wasn't there. My brother saw it and his friend saw it, but I didn't see it. Mm. So, but you know, we we guys we go out there. We put boots on the ground all the time. If I weren't for the fact of my granddaughter being ill and this thing we have to do, I'd be out there probably every day. Mm -hmm. but, and I'm getting older too, too. I mean, so it's a little bit more difficult for me to do the things I used to do. But for the younger generations that are out there, use proper scientific methods and techniques. Use your head. You know, don't go out there expecting to see a Bigfoot behind every tree or every bush. But keep your eyes open. There's too many people nowadays, and I hate to say this because we're using it right now. They're looking at their cell phone. They're not looking at the sky. They're not looking around. 
I mean, just today, my wife works part time at Walmart. I'm at I'm at the parking lot. People walk right out of Walmart, right in front of cars. Yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, you might you might survive a car hitting you, but maybe they get you might not. Okay. Yeah. But, I mean, I I mean I I mean I'll be honest with you. I don't like to curse, but I'm telling you what. If I drive through Walmart parking lot one more time, I'm gonna let loose. Seriously. Yeah. But because it's not bad uh, anymore. It was like early today. I was out and about with my grandson. I had to go take care of some errands and whatnot. But, you know, I'm coming to a stoplight and your car's in front of me. So I'm coming to my stop. And I just so happened to look up in my rearview mirror. That little black car flying right up behind me. I swear he was going to slam into me. I said, no, 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 you better not. Because I was like, I, <laughs> I can't afford to have my vehicle messed up right now. But uh, I swear they must have been on their phone and not paying attention. <laughs> But they came well, so we, close. <laughs> I know five times my wife and I almost been killed on Route 70. One of the mm. here because the people are running stop signs that are on the sides of the road and stop not looking. I mean, five times. I had one guy almost t bone me twice, okay, with my wife in the car and stuff. And so it's, it's bad. Just uh, two weeks ago, I was sitting in the parking lot. I do have something else to protect myself with, and it's a good thing I did. I actually use it as a walking stick. But it's a collapsible baton. Okay. So it's about this. In fact, I have it sitting right there. But uh, anyhow, so I'm sitting in the car. Now, my SUV is a Ford Escape four-wheel drive. And so I lower the seat to give me more room. And I, lower, I tilt it back. So, and I'm watching the phone. I'm watching a video on my phone while my wife's working. And these three guys, I have the window down. And these three guys come walking by. They're in their mid, mid to late 20s. And the one guy looks at me and says, what the F are you looking at? I said, you. He said, we're going to kick your... You know what? I said, really? So I guess they thought I was real short because I'm sitting in the car. So I opened the door and I stood up and they went like this and gave me a double ticket. So we're still going to kick your butt. I said, really? And I whipped out this thing, went like this and flicked it and opened up to 31 inches long and they ran out of the parking lot. So Wow. <laughs> but wow. Is, we, just had, we just had a shooting up here at a playground where a guy got shot in the head and killed. Oh, wow. So, hmm. I mean, I mean, it's crazy up here and stuff. You know, we've had people disappearing, as you said, in the uh, they just busted somebody up in uh, from out of state, human trafficking and things of this nature. I mean, you you were right when you said there's more danger in the woods than Bigfoot and other animals. Human beings are worse. Mm -hmm. They're the worst. Oh yeah, I agree. You know, kill, <laughs> you know, so. But like I said, I mean, uh, what I like to, to to give to your viewers is simply this: Look, there's a lot of things we don't know about. There's a lot. Of, I mean, I've been in this for 54 years. I don't know everything. I don't pretend to know everything. I probably will never know everything. You know, we had these hearings on this disclosure on, on Wednesday and people came forward that worked in the government said there's UFOs. We have non-human bodies and, and we have their craft and everything else. And people seeing them worldwide fighter pilots in the air force fighter pilots from the Navy. You know, we've seen them diving into the ocean. Uh, there was a massive one seen by the Japanese airline. Back in the day, it was bigger than three uh, three aircraft carriers, and it flew right next to them. That was documented. So, I mean, there's things going on right now that we need to find out, and we can't we can't just sit back and let these things happen because these things are far more technologically advanced than we are. They our fastest jets can't keep up with. Them. Our missiles cannot catch them. Okay, if there's ever been a shoot down. It's been more by luck than anything else, okay? We had these sightings over, what was it, Lake Michigan, where they had some so-called balloons. They thought they were the Chinese balloons, but they weren't Chinese balloons, not those. There were some Chinese balloons shot down, but not the ones that were over the lake up here, okay? So there's something going on. They're here for a reason. Now, I'm going to say something here, and again, your viewers are going to think, some of them are going to think that John's crazy and a bed bug, but John's not. Because John can prove everything he said. When I went under regression, and I will give you a copy of the tape, I asked, when you're taken, I remember, Devin, remember I told you we were parked at that Old West Cemetery? Well, mm -hmm. he, right. He, he pointed those three orbs out. They weren't there. That was a distraction. They were behind us. Okay, because under regression, I remember them coming to the car and taking us out of the car. I remember us, they were parked behind some trees. I remember walking up a ramp, and, and they, they had three of them were walking with Devin, one in front, two, one on either side, and two with me. I walked up this ramp, 
and it sounded like I was walking up a wooden ramp, but it wasn't wood. I put, I stopped at the entrance way and I put my hand on the side of the craft and it was warm, but look, I could see like laminate layers on the side. When you first walk in, there's not, there's a wall there. It's curved like this, but it, so if you can't go straight in, you have to go around and up some steps into the top part. When we were taken upstairs, they put him on a low, a low bench. They put me on a table and they did their examination. I looked up and I could actually see there's like a, a some type of screen on the ceiling that was lit and you could actually see the ground receding away from me. And Devin substantiated this as well, just so you know. So we're not we're not crazy. We both want to. I mean, you're not gonna, we're not going to lie. But I wouldn't even tell you this if I thought people would think you know, I, I really don't care. Though. Anyhow, <laughs> but I remember this distinctly. And I remember that the one that did the examination wasn't the one that piloted the craft. That was the one in charge of their mission. Now, they told me, when you, when you and I talk, I'm seeing your face and you're seeing mine, right? There's right. a lot of nonverbal communication going on, is there not? Oh, yeah. I, I mean, eyes. oh, I yeah. Your eyes. I can see your, what's your impact of what I'm saying on your eyes, and you can see my impact of what I'm saying through my eyes, right? That's nonverbal communication. When they communicate, it's like a close, it's telepathy of a type. But when you open that door to some, then they open the door to my mind or anybody's mind, you can see a little bit into their mind through that little bit of door they leave open. I know that their race is about 5 million years older than ours. I know they're not here for any good. They have their own agenda. We're genetic fodder. That's it. Now they've been here a long time, but they're not they're not the they're not what you would call normal biological entities. They're I think they're I think they were made. I don't think they're normal. They have no digestive system, no heart, no lungs, no excretory system at all. They're designed for space travel. Their bones are stronger than ours. They're strong for their size. But not strong as a full one. It's not strong as a full-grown man. Travis Walton substantiated that when he was taken. He was gone for five days. Okay. So what what's scary about this is when I didn't feel like I know that Whitley Stryber. You know who he is. He wrote a book called Communion, and he says they're benevolent. I respect Whitley Stryber for his encounter. I believe he did have one, but they're not benevolent. They're not here for any good. If they were here to help, wouldn't they give you a cure for cancer if that they're that advanced? Wouldn't they give you a cure for all illnesses? Right? Wouldn't, wouldn't they do that? You and think. Other, yeah. and, the other, and the other thing I have to ask, and you know, if you have a race that advanced with interstellar capability to come to Earth, what's the odds of them crashing all the time? Do you think it's a possibility they crash deliberately so they can offload some technology to us that way? I don't know. All I can tell you is that we that the government has acknowledged now that we have craft of theirs in our possession. We have alien bodies, non-human bodies in our possession. They've been here for a long time, not just since 1947 in Roswell, but long before that, thousands and thousands of years before that. You know, you have uh, every culture in the world talks about ancient aliens. They talk about Gods from the sky. The Hindu yeah, I even, I even watched a documentary. Uh, I don't know, you know, I found it very fascinating. I mean, I'm not going to say it was made up or nothing because, I mean, the documentary was very sincere. Uh, but up in Alaska, you know, Alaska has a lot of mystery. But supposedly there's some kind of underground uh, pyramid of some sort. Yeah. Yes. A giant triangle. That's, that's right. the Alaskan triangle. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, and that they call it the Alaskan Triangle. Sixteen thousand people have disappeared up there. Can't attribute that all to getting lost in the woods or bear attacks or cougar attacks, right? Sixteen thousand people have disappeared up there. Okay, there's more people disappeared up there than there has been in the Bermuda Triangle. Around the world, there's a Japanese triangle as well. I think they call it the Dragon Triangle. Okay. Hmm. Ships and people disappear there too, but the most are the Alaska Triangle. Okay. You remember years ago, there was a, I think it was a congressman that disappeared up there. They never found him. Never. 
or his crew, they had a massive search for, I guess, two, three weeks, couldn't find him. Planes that went looking for him disappeared as well. Uh, when when uh, Kenneth Arnold saw those nine disc-shaped objects flying over Mount Rainier, they weren't really discs. They were triangular-shaped like this. They were sort of roundish, sort of like that big thing I saw. Okay, there were nine of them. They were skipping across the sky. He said, like plate, like saucer. That's where the term flying saucer came in. But they weren't saucer shaped. You've had different types of craft. You've had cigar shaped mothership type craft. You've had round orb. There was a, a fighter pilot in the F 14 some years ago. He was flying at about 25,000 feet and he came up, his, his radar lit up, and in front of him was a, a looked like a rock hovering in the sky. It's probably the size of a car. As he approached and tried to get a lock on with his missiles, it shot straight up in the air. Now, this is from a, a military pilot. But, so whatever power source they have enables them to put it in something small enough, they can put it in something the size of a car and disappear. You've heard of the Rendlesham case, where it was by the uh, United States Air Force Base in Rendlesham in England, okay, where it was on the ground and multiple people saw it, okay? This is a worldwide, okay? Now, the other thing I want to say is this. I talked about USOs earlier, under, under, un, unidentified submersible objects. There's been reports of craft going under the water at near Mach 1, over 700 mile an hour under the water. We have nothing like that. Nothing, not even close. Our fastest torpedo is probably 50 mile an hour under the water. Our fastest submarine, our attack submarines, they're listed at 45 knots under the water, okay? So whatever these craft have, they generate some type of field around it as well. Something that lets, enables them to slip through the water without actually touching the water. Uh, it's, it's like they turn on, like, uh, now here's where I get into dimensional stuff. It's like they shift the, the, the area around the craft into a di different dimension. So it's not actually in this dimension, but the craft inside is in this dimension. So they can go through the water and exit the water or enter it without leaving a splash. That's my theory right now. They're using some type of dimensional shift. Now, if you know anything about physics, if you overcome gravity, therefore you overcome inertia. Okay, it's one of the laws of physics. So what that means is, is that they make these right angle turns at thousands of miles an hour. Our pilots would be crushed to jelly if they were try that. We can't do that. They can so they're, they're, they have an internal gravity field that's separate from our gravity field, so they can make these right angle turns, whereas we can't and elude us. Uh, there was a picture taken by a NASA satellite of a UFO just outside of our atmosphere, and somebody, I think it might have been France from the direction I saw from the from ground, shot a missile off at it. It waited till almost the last second and invaded the missile. NASA itself is talking about seeing things on the moon. Okay, uh, Neil Armstrong is talking about that as well. Uh, there's been a theory espoused that the moon is hollow. Well, when uh, Apollo 11, I believe it was, jettisoned the takeoff vehicle and it crashed into the moon, the moon rang like a bell for eight hours. Mm. That, indicated, that indicated the moon is hollow. Okay, so is it a natural sphere? It's not comprised of anything from, like, there's been theories back in the day that said that, that one time the moon was part of the earth and it split off for whatever reason it's early in our or in the, uh, when it our formation over the earth but when they check the rocks the rocks have no bearing with anything similar on earth so it's a separate satellite that maybe we captured or maybe it was brought here i mean like i said i could talk about this kind of stuff for hours and hours and hours and i'm sure your viewers are like hmm, that i didn't maybe i didn't know that or maybe i but the thing is this again you, it, you, people need to get their heads out of the sand. They, they worry about the most mundane things nowadays. Of course, their jobs, their health, their families. I, I get all that. I understand. I have all that too, okay? But the thing is this. There's more to what's going on around you than you will ever know. But for the hardy people that go out in the woods like yourself and do these investigations of all types, I give you all the credit in the world. You're the younger generation that's taken over from old parts like me, okay? And you're the ones that are going to maybe make a disclosure of some type. I, I won't. I know they exist. I know Bigfoot exists. I've seen UFOs nine times. I know they exist. 
okay? I haven't seen the Loch Ness Monster, of course, or uh, the uh, Champy up in Lake Champlain. I haven't seen yeah. that yet. I haven't seen that one yet, but... but yeah. Is, uh, Daniel, the, there's a lot of stuff going on on this planet that, that, you know, and we really need to take a closer look to our history. And some wise guy, one very wise man said one time, you don't know where you're going until you know where you've been. And that's the truth. Mm -hmm. And another wise man said, we stand on the shoulder of giants when it comes to knowledge. We do. Isaac Newton, you know, the early astronomers. Copernicus was labeled a heretic because he, at the time, the, the church said that the, the earth was the center of the universe and everything revolved around the earth. The sun and everything else and the stars all revolved around the earth. No, it don't. The earth revolves around the sun, okay? And we're on the edge of a pie plate in the Milky Way galaxy, right on the very edge, okay? We're just a small little planet in the habitable zone of, a, of our star. And we don't even have the biggest star. There's another star. It's a, it can have 10 billion of our suns inside of it. And our sun mm. alone can have a million Earths inside of it. So figure it out. And there's giant wormholes out there. You know, there's a lot of things going on out there we don't know. Yeah, know Na yeah, NASA even admitted to the wormholes, you know. Uh, you know, I mean, it's not like what people think is uh, when it comes to sci-fi stuff. But, yeah, there's wormholes that NASA, uh, NASA has admitted to uh, publicly. So, well, yeah, I, I mean. Show you, I want to show you something. I want to explain in, in the, the easiest terms for anybody watching what bending time and space is. See this paper? So you're mm -hmm. here, you're here a hundred light years away. Wait, I'll do it this way. You're here. This is a hundred light years away from this star over here, right? Right. So you want to you want to warp space. So what do you do? You bend it. Right. That's the simplest way to explain it. Well listen, Absolutely. Uh, we're about finished up here, I would imagine here, but uh yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, before I go. Well, I tell you, there was a couple of questions from earlier. We could uh, we could answer real quick. Um, Go ahead. But yeah, I do want to mention uh, before I get to the questions, uh, we're definitely going to have you on again. Um, this information has been very informative. Um, it's it's actually intrigued me, and it's got me thinking about a few things. So that you know, and I've always been trying to. I'm somebody that's always you know kept an open mind, uh, but yeah, at the same time, there's a lot of different things out there that I. I feel like I have to re remain objective. And when I say that, I, you know, it doesn't mean that I'm going to uh, dismiss something either. But, um, right. but with learning new information uh, from, you know, like from you, for example, is it going to give me something to think about a little bit more and to possibly start looking more into, you know? So, mm. well, um, I mean, what I would do, I mean, just a suggestion, I would look up, uh, in anthropology, I would look up the early hominins as I mentioned, the Gigantopithecus and the Denisovan. Right. Just, you know, and but again, and look up primate uh, an anatomy and stuff. And when I talk oh, yeah. about the, the sagittal crest, there's no sagittal crest on on Bigfoot, so he's not a he's not an ape, it's not an ape, it's not a right. primate as we know it. Absolutely. Um, two questions. Uh, now I don't know if she's still listening. Uh, a good friend of mine. Uh, her, her and her husband are usually on here together, David and Melissa Lester. Um, but David's sleeping right now because he's uh, got to get up at about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning uh, for work. So Melissa is asking, uh, this is her first, she asked two questions. Her first one is, do you believe in gifting? And then why or why not? I guess as far as relating to Bigfoot. So, uh yeah, I think, yeah, but if you're going to do something like that, you better be darn sure that you're not inviting. It's just like anything else. It's, it's just like if you ask the, like these, the ghost hunters, I didn't even get to ghost it tonight, but if you ask the ghost hunter, the worst thing you can do is invite a ghost. Uh, you know, once you use a spirit box to talk to a ghost, you're actually inviting it in. It's just like using a Ouija board. You're opening a doorway. Are you sure you really want to open that door? Okay. You can gift if you want, but Think about the consequences if it goes wrong, okay? Mm -hmm. If you've got a family, think about that too. Because, again, we're, not, we're dealing with something totally unknown, something unpredictable. We don't know what these things are. So if, before you start doing something like that, 
you might want to think about the consequences. Okay, and if you're willing, if you're willing to accept the consequences for it, fine. But think about right. the family you have. Absolutely, and I see. I address that in a similar way when, like, people go out to the woods, they camp, and they want to put food. You know, and I've always told them, I said that's a big no-no for a couple different reasons. You got wildlife out there. You start in, uh, inviting wildlife in there, and you start leaving food out there. They're gonna be uh, become habituated to that and almost start becoming dependent on that. And you stop leaving food there, they're gonna start coming around these areas where people camp especially with their families, like you said, you know, so yeah, that could create an issue. The other thing is too, if you're leaving food, you don't know if these various species of wildlife might have allergies that we don't know about either. You might be causing more harm on that end too. So, or, or, um, they have, or they're rabid. They could be rabid oh, too. Right, right, absolutely. So you'd be now, with that. So here's the other question I had up here uh, from Melissa as well. She said, human and uh, animal mutilations are real. Do you believe Sasquatch or Bigfoot are also abducted? Uh, not really, no. I don't think so. I don't think they're, they are. Okay. I think, they are. I think they're actually working with whatever's doing that. Interesting. All right. Well, there you go, Melissa, if you're still on. Uh, so <laughs> um, okay, well, I'll tell you, we we hit a little over two hours, um, but this is this has been an amazing uh, show. We're going to be in touch, too, um, and I definitely want to get you back on here. And Because uh, every so often when I'm not always just interviewing a guest and letting them talk, sometimes I, bri uh, I bring in a few others. So we, we have roundtable discussions, and topics could go in every different direction. And, I, you know, like you mentioned earlier, you're very random on topics and discussing things. Again, I'm the same way, especially when I do a presentation. I mean, I have a presentation put together. I'm usually edited. I'm always changing it or adding to it. Um, but I, I have it in a certain order to where I present things uh, in a certain way. Yeah, but it's still random. But um, so, yeah, there's nothing wrong with being random. That's for sure. <laughs> Um, I'm, glad, I'm glad. I'm glad that you know everybody enjoyed it, and I mean that's the main thing, you know. But uh, and I appreciate being on here and stuff. And uh, yes, I'll, I'll do it again. But I'll have to thank my wife for being able to get to get on here because she's the one that got this taken care of for me. Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh, uh, you could thank her for me too on that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and Melissa. Oh, I'm just saying, Melissa just commented said she's still here, so. Okay. Well, listen, <laughs> yeah. I'll I'll say good night to you, and I really enjoyed this, and uh, we'll have to do it again. Absolutely. And she said thank you. Uh, she said this was definitely interesting. And his name's not Scott; it's John. She because she said thank you, Scott. <laughs> okay. No problem. <laughs> so hey, thank you for coming on, and ladies and gentlemen, uh, be sure if you're out and about uh, the next coming event right here in Pennsylvania. You can find me at, uh, speaking at this event August 12th at Memorial Park Avenue in Ellisburg, Pennsylvania. Um, that's going to be uh, – this event has been advertised and promoted real big on uh, several different news networks up there in that part of Pennsylvania. It's been in papers. Um, we really think this is going to be a big event. Gwendolyn Purcell, uh, the owner of Got Knockers, is the host of this event. Uh, this is her first time hosting and organizing this uh, inaugural event. So if you're in the area, check it out. Um, so I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And, um, yeah, you can find me speaking there. And who knows? If John's able to, John, maybe you can come out and check that out. So, maybe but, um, see. Absolutely. And then the weekend after this one here is the Patsy Hillman uh, Park event. In Hiller, Pennsylvania, um, I am scheduled to be there as well. Hopefully, funds work in my favor to attend that event. So, <laughs> we'll so that. absolutely. And then, uh, for those you know, I've been advertising and promoting our 2024 annual ECBRO Virginia Bigfoot Conference. It's a two-day event, June 14th and the 15th. We'll have both Bigfoot paranormal cryptids, the unknown. Uh, we're going to have. Uh, there will be UFO. Uh, my other committee team members are working on gathering the UFO and MUFON people, um, as well as paranormal. Uh, we'll have various uh, vendors, guest speakers, food, and more. So 
definitely uh, check that out. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you guys for listening tonight. Um, if you're catching us at a later date, uh, feel free. If you're new to this, subscribe. We appreciate your subscription and your follow. And be sure to share this around. So meanwhile, John, thank you very much. And I really appreciate you coming on. This has been amazing and very informative. I really love what you had to share tonight. So thank you very much. Absolutely. Until next time, guys, keep it squatchy and we're out.